retirement uh, board to order. Uh, let's do a head count, a, a roll call. Andrew? Here. Uh, Sunita? I'm here. Howard is on jury duty. Eshvar? Here. Dick? Dick, you're, maybe I'm mute. Yes, yes, I got you. Thank you. Franco? Here. Uh, Dave is, we're trying to get in. Is, are you here yet, Dave? Okay. No, he's, I, he's actually right here next to me. <laughs> okay. Okay. Hi, Dave. <laughs> um, so we've got one, two, three, four, five. We've got seven. Quorum is five. We're in good shape. Um, our first item of duty here is a bittersweet one. I'm going to read a commendation we have for Vince and Zeri, and I will call for a vote and then open the floor um, for comments. And, and if you'll allow me, I will make um, some chairman comments. Um, in fact, let me point, this will be a slightly unusual meeting. I'll bring some a few times. I'm gonna weigh in a bunch during this, meet, this meeting, just unusual, unusual, a perfect storm. There's a lot of events, I think, that call for chairman's hand. And so if you'll allow me after I read this, I'll weigh in a bit um, on, on Vince. Um, whereas Vincent Zeri was appointed to the Board of Administration of the City of San Jose Police and Fire Retirement Plan in December 2010 as a public member, he's an old guy, and whereas in appreciation of Vince's 10 years and seven months of service, Vince was the vice chairman in 2017 and chairman of the board from 2018 to 2019 calendar year for the Board of Administration of the City of San Jose Police and Fire Retirement Plan and Whereas Vince served as chairman of investment committee 2010 to 2017, governance committee 2013 to 2014, and chair of the JPC Joint Personnel Committee 2018-2021, and this goes on forever, I love Vince, whereas Vince paved the way on the following ad hoc committees, Cortex, um, Applied Research Governance Project Response, Measure G Implementation, and the City Audit Response, and Whereas Vince served on the investment committee for 10 years, helping guide investment strategy, updating the IPS to reflect improved governance standards and maintain the fiscal soundness of the system. And whereas Vince has offered stability and progressive view during a period of composition change of the board, administration, administrative staff, and the economy, and has offered his leadership and guidance on numerous issues throughout his tenure, including but not limited to the implementation of measures B, G, F, and in the approval of the pension pay correction plan. Now, therefore, be it resolved by this board of administration, police and fire department, retirement plan, city of San Jose, that the board of administration extends its thanks to Vincent Zeri for his dedicated years of service to the police and fire retirement department plan and for his adherence to high standards of quality, ethics, and integrity for this board and for his performance of valued service. I move that we approve this commendation. Do I have a second? Second by Santos. That's great. I'm gonna go around the room looking for um, eyes. Here we go. Uh, Andrew? Aye. Anita? Aye. Ashwar? Aye. Uh, Dick, aye or nay? Yes. Franco? Aye. Dave. Aye. And I uh, vote aye as well. So if you'll allow me to uh, take the chairman's prerogative and speak first um, about Vince. Dick and I have been on this board the whole time. Uh, Dick was actually on the board. I, I joined shortly after Vince did. I'm the third, I'm the man in the middle. And so I have to be approved. I have to be approved by him. Um, First of all, let me point out the city plans um, to commend Vince separately. Uh, I, they're working on that. I know Roberto has been helpful um, in answering our questions about that. Um, I have a favorite quote of all time, and it applies to Vince. And the quote is from Branch Rickey, the baseball manager who first um, integrated uh, black baseball players into the major leagues. And it's a long quote, but the summary line you're probably all familiar says luck is the residue of design. And you probably know that idea as a more commonly quoted line that fortune favors the prepared mind. And throughout this meeting today, 
as I exercise my chairman's privilege, I'm going to keep pointing out that we do two things, one of which is easy and one of which is hard. We plan, that's pretty easy, and we've done a great job with under Prabhu and Roberto, but we also forecast, and that's very hard, and that's how we've gotten in trouble um, in the past. So let me, let me, <laughs> so let me tell you something about Vince. So in an unrelated um, manner, I asked Prabhu about a month ago to send me our, our discount rate and our actual returns. And then he sent it to me and it's for the uh, pension obligation bond stuff we'll do later. So then Vince, yes. uh, after I asked for that, Vince let me know, I said, shoot, Morgan Stanley said, I gotta get off the board. Um, and and we, he and I chatted, it was a very friendly chat. And he and I have become pretty good friends during this period. So I actually ran the numbers. I thought, well, how, how did Vince do during his tenure? This is gonna blow your mind, guys. So if, you had given someone a dollar when Vince came on this board, you know, at the, at the breaking fiscal years, and he had some responsibility. Had you given someone a dollar and given someone else a dollar and told the first person you gave the dollar to, you know what, I will give you a return that is the discount rate they forecast. And had the second person, you said, I will give you the actual return, the plan, achieves right one is what the plan forecast and one is what the plan did remember forecasts are hard this is gonna blow your mind folks it blew my mind the first person would have one dollar and 94 cents and a little bit of scrapings of copper the second person would have like you blew my mind one dollar and 94 cents and a slightly different amount of scrapings of copper in other words over Vince's tenure, the actual return, now it goes up and down. It, was, it, was, it never hit the discount rate. Some years it's higher, some years it's lower. The actual compound return over Vince's tenure was virtually identical to the forecast discount rate return. And if you counted those little shavings of copper, it would turn out that there was a delta of a quarter of a penny. Now, I think Vince would be the first person to say that that was more luck than skill. But again, as Branch Rickey famously said, Luck is the residue of design. And I don't think there can be a higher compliment to pay to someone in Vince's position that he hit his discount rate. You might think exceeding your discount rate would be a bigger compliment. I'm not quite sure that's the case because the whole point of a discount rate is to forecast what you will do. And beating your discount rate means you didn't forecast well, or maybe the markets did something really unusual. Over the, the course of this decade, Vince and I have become friends. So he's become a grandfather. None of my kids were married. N neither his two were married. And, and married, lots of marriages have happened. He's now a grandfather. I, I, Vince, if you're watching this, I'm happy to say my eldest daughter just told us a couple of weeks ago she's expecting our first grandchild. So um, that, those are my thoughts. Um, uh, we're going to miss you, Vince. We, I always like to say that if you're not having fun, you're doing it wrong. And God bless, man, Vince. We had a lot of fun over the last decade. Um, I'll go around um, the trustees, and then I'll open the floor to anyone else who wants to say anything about Dick. Andrew, you want to make any comments? I do. Thank you, Drew. Um, and, and the comments that you made, you were excellent. And, and it shows, you know, from the investment side, you know, you know how well he's done. Um, there's not too many of us on this board, including myself, that could really appreciate what Vince has done for this board, for the for the um, the members um, of the plan, and for the city. Um, you know, Drew, you were on around that time. Dick, you were there. Sean Caldor was there at the very beginning. Um, Roberto wasn't even on on you know uh, with the plan yet at this time. And from my understanding, what um, it wasn't a well oil, oil machine. Over the last decade or so, that has transformed to um, where Measure G was passed. We were able to hire um, an excellent CEO and CIO that everybody is really happy with um, and has paid dividends to the plan. Um, we got uh, trustees who are all on the same page and working together uh, with one goal in mind. And a lot of this came from the leadership of, of Vince. Um, I have never been around a person that has so prepared and so involved like Vince was for any meeting. Uh, when I was vice chair and he was chair, his constant communication with me, 
Uh, his foresight and planning ahead was bar none to anybody else. Uh, and I learned a lot from him. I'm definitely gonna miss him as a trustee, as a friend, and as a member of this plan. Um, and I can't thank him enough for what he has done. Um, we are, this plan is in such a better place than it was 10 years ago when he came on in 2010. So thank you very much. I wish you were here for another 10 more years, um, but uh, we I'll take whatever we could get. And um, thank you again from me personally and as a plan member. Thanks a lot, Andrew. Sinta, do you wanna make any remarks? Um, you know, I've known Vince for a very short period of time, but uh, it's too bad that uh, he retired before I could meet him in person. Always enjoyed his comments and uh, intellectual insights through, throughout the meeting. So I wish him luck uh, and I, I, like all of you, thank him for his service. Thank you. Thanks. Eshwar, do you want to make any remarks? Yeah, so uh, I joined the board when Vince was the chair um, and I took over his position on the investment committee. Um, you know, he and I have talked a lot outside of meetings. Um, I've always, always used him as a resource in terms of, you know, kind of understanding, you know, how the board works, you know, how people think um, and, you know, what is the right thing to do uh, as, a, you know, when I took over as the chair of the investment committee. Uh, he's been a great resource. Uh, you know, he and I talked after, you know, after he left uh, and, you know, he said I can call him anytime if, uh, you know, if I had any questions, um, you know, just to, you know, kind of shoot the breeze, you know, to think what he thinks about things we're trying to do. So, a great resource, uh, you know, love him as a person, um, and I think we're gonna miss him. Yeah, thank you, nicely said. Dick? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Sinceri, our trustee, uh, he completely overhauled the investment process, and uh, he took it very seriously, and um, was always a professional when it came to investments and whatever have you. Um, we, I know, we helped rid of some of the personnel that were here, that were dragging. He was also supportive of Roberto to be hired. We reached out. Uh, he took his job very, very seriously and was very responsible and elevated this system to be very, very excellent. Uh, working with the city council brought more confidence for all of us. So uh, Vince, be safe and thank you for your service. Nicely said, Dick. Franco, I don't know if you want to make any remarks. I'll just echo what everybody else said and, and again, thank him and wish him the best moving forward. That's great. Um, I don't know if you want to say anything, Dave, you're going to miss getting to know a great guy. Yeah, I think that's what I'm going to say is uh, I'm getting in at the wrong time because he's uh, just leaving. I don't know what I did to events to run you off, but I apologize. Please come back. That's great. I, I'm sure that Roberto and Prabhu will want to say something. Do you want to go first, Roberto? I'll let Prabhu go first. He, he raised his hands a lot quicker than I did. Uh, ah. I, didn't mean, I didn't mean to catch him when he was drinking his coffee, but uh, go ahead, Prabhu. <laughs> well, um, I don't know if Vince is listening to this. Uh, to say, you know, um, I've known Vince for about three and a half years as the CIO, and before that, I was in the investment committee as a trustee and knew him as part of the joint investment committee. So I've known him for about five years. And the investment team can tell you, he was tough. It was not, it was not easy to deal with Vince. He pushed us. He pushed us in many ways. His heart was always in the right place, and he made us a better investment team at the end of the day, right? And um, I have to say, you know, that there was no bigger champion of our investment process and investment team uh, than Vince. Uh, we had our share of disagreements, but once we made a decision, you know, he fully endorsed it. And when I, whenever I went in front of the city council, he was the sole trustee and either board to stand there with me to take the tough questions. It was always a joint staff trustee decision. So Vince, you made us a better team. You made me a better CIO. We'll miss you. I'll miss having star, uh, you know, coffee with you in Los Gatos. And as uh, as Trustee Wilson said, hope you come back someday. Thank you. Berto, do you want to make a few remarks? Yes, yes, I do. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first of all, let me just say I hope uh, I, I texted uh, Vince this morning. I hope he's uh, he's listening to us. Um, and what can I say? Right? I mean. 
echo everyone's words. Um, uh, I can tell you, and I have mentioned this before, either to many of you individually or public board meetings, half the battle uh, of a trustee really is, is to be committed and to be engaged. And honestly, as, as uh, uh, Andrew indicated, uh, certainly I haven't really met that many trustees that have, have his commitment and engagement uh, for such a long time as, as uh, Vince had. Uh, I think in terms of what Prabhu said, he's absolutely right. He made us a better office, better staff. I can tell you that he, no one prepared for the board meetings better than Vince, and that made us uh, staff uh, certainly <laughs> better prepared for the meetings. So um, we owe him the, uh, um, a lot of gratitude for his hard work and dedication to the plan and to the plan members uh, over his last 10 and a half years. And, and really uh, to thank him also for uh, the strong support of staff. Um, he was tough and uh, he will tell you when he was in disagreement with you, uh, but I always appreciated that uh, we knew where we stand with Vince. Uh, he was uh, very consistent and on his comments, and 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 you knew where he was. Uh, even if you didn't quite understand where he was coming from, you understood that uh, uh, he uh, had a lot of uh, belief in in the approach that he was taking. So um, he was very straightforward, and I can tell you as a, as a staff, we appreciate that because we can be better prepared to address issues and to work, uh, especially in a public setting. So Vince, thank you so much for your 10 and a half years, your commitment and engagement and support and hard work and dedication and second to none. And on behalf of your peers at the board, on behalf of our office staff, and above anything else, on behalf of the plan members, we thank you and we wish you the best. Thank you very much. Nicely said, Roberto. The floor is open if anybody um, in the audience would like to make any remarks. Not hearing any. Um, what's our next thing? We're going to close session, right, Prabhu? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Great. Um, so I guess well, you guys invite us to go ahead, Linda. You guys invite us to close session and we'll, we'll drop into closed session to discuss, uh, uh, discuss an investment.
I'm gonna look at my agenda here. Okay, back in open session, right? We're we're a little bit early, which is good. We've got a very long board meeting today, so everybody put your comfortable socks on. Um, orders of the day. So um, the orders of the day, each time we sort of Zoom protocol, right? So in general, um, we will see three different kinds of agenda items. We always see this every meeting. The first kind is the floor is open for question and answers. It's really almost as if it was a live meeting. There's not going to be a lot of back and forth. The second thing is where we really do want every trustee to weigh in. Um, these are the kind of meetings in person where you see four hands up in the chairs frantically and writing down names to take them in order. And I will do a round robin on that as well as round robins on both. And there's a third kind, which we've seen at some meetings, not all, and that is where we very broadly open up the floor to anyone who's on this call. Um, at least the pension obligation bond issue will be that way, um, as Vince's thing was. I don't know if there'll be other ones. So I'll sort of let you know um, which protocol we're going to use if it's not um, obvious. Um, so that's, uh, let's see, that was the um, orders of the day. Um, items we're waving sunshine on, I'll need, I'll need a motion and a second vote. So uh, my bad, we did not get the updated um, committee assignments um, into the original agenda. Howard <laughs> Howard pointed out both of these. Howard's, Howard's our new Vince. He reads everything. Um, and they are now um, in, in the board, uh, in the deck, and we will discuss them later in this meeting. The second one, Howard laughed yesterday when he let me know he's going to be on jury duty, noticed that there was an error in my presentation on POVs. Um, so we've updated that deck. Linda says that will be put into um, our package after this meeting. When I go through the deck, I've, I've drawn a square around the number that was in error, and I will call that out at the time. So we're more, more correcting the record for future gener generations. I will call out the error in real time. Um, do I have a motion to waive sunshine on these items for F and for I? So moved by Santos. <clears throat> second, second by Gardenier. I have a motion by Santos, second by, An by Gardenier. Andrew, how do you vote? Aye. Donita? Aye. Far. Aye. Dick? Yes. Franco? Aye. Dave? Aye. I Chair Lanza votes um, I as well. All right, let me see. Okay. Um, so that brings us then to um, item one on our agenda, the consent calendar. Does anybody want to pull anything off the consent calendar? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, huh? it's not that I particularly want to pull an item. I guess I am in a way, but I just wanted to call attention to the calipers uh conference thank you the calipers virtual principles of pension governance for trustees is going to be at the end of this month and it's a very very good um seminar for new trustees so uh, those of you that are new to the board i would strongly suggest to consider joining that meeting so again it's three days but it's not full days it's probably just half a day and it's virtual so uh, I would strongly recommend that you join, uh, if you have the chance and the time, to, to join that, uh, that seminar from Calipers. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks. Thanks, Roy. I, I, I haven't done these. Have you done these virtual ones, Roberto? Are they okay on Zoom? Or usually in person, yeah. the presentations are really good. Yeah, they, they are really good, actually. And, and I think the, the beauty of this, uh, usually, I, I have to be honest, I look at the agenda, but I don't recall right now, but usually... Uh, it's not a full day of Zoom, so they alternate and, and they probably make it uh, uh, some morning or some afternoon for a few hours. So, uh, But I have attended meetings before and seminars for uh, um, our position right across the state, and, and they have been uh, very well received and attended. So I would strongly recommend it. That's great. Thanks. Um, do I have a motion to approve the consent calendar? So moved by Santos. Uh, do I have a second? Second, Gardner. Motion by Santa, second by Gardner. I'll call for the vote. Andrew? Aye. Anita? Aye. Ashbar? Aye. Dick? Yes. 
Franco. Aye. And Dave. Aye. This is Chair Lanza. I vote aye as well. The uh, consent calendar is approved. Uh, brings us to investments. Over to you, Prabhu. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so this month we have our usual quarterly performance updates through June 30th for the public markets and through the first quarter for private markets. But before we get to that, uh, quickly share a monthly per performa performance through the end of August 31st. Uh, the police and fire pension plan was up 2.24%. Um, and just so everyone knows, you know, the, the, we've had a strong market again this, this year, uh, calendar year, our, our pension plan is up 11 and a half percent. And, uh, but as you also know, the markets are pretty rich and fully valued at this point. The Schiller PE, for those of you who follow uh, measures of richness in the market, Schiller PE is at 39. And the all time high of the Schiller PE was 44 uh, in the last hundred years. And that was in December, 1999. So unless there's a dramatic boost to E, which is earnings, uh, markets will continue to be looked on as pretty overvalued. So we, we expect us to have a rocky fiscal year and we have to be vigilant and lots of good discussions in the months ahead. Um, with that, Mr. Chairman, I know I'd like to keep this brief. We have a long day ahead. I'm happy to take any questions. If not, uh, we can move to 2B. Uh, let's see, 2B. Um, I, I see presentation calendar first quarter 2021 by Newberger Berman. Uh, Casey, that's uh, probably you. That is me. Happy to take over. And if you give me one minute, I will share. Well, I'm, it looks like I'm not able to share my screen. Um, you probably need, uh, Linda, can you give Casey permission to do that? She has permission to do that. Okay, let me try again. Ah, uh, the joys of modern troubles in the 21st century. <laughs> okay, I think I got it. Okay. Luckily, I'm better at investing than um, technology. I assure you. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Okay, let me make it my full screen. Okay, here we go. So, um, as as Prabhu hinted, uh, we continue to see very positive developments within the portfolio. Today, I am sharing um, the Q1 marks. Um, which are at this point um, a little bit dated. So I also have just some commentary on what um, Q2 will look like as well. Um, but overall for Q1, we saw, as I mentioned, very good uh, progress and return generation for your program. Um, we, during that quarter, we made one co-investment. So as of um, the end of Q1, there were a total of 23 primary fund investments, three secondary investments, and 33 co-investments, um, staying on track with um, our model portfolio and plan as we are deploying capital. Overall, um, the multiple on the Newberger program and strategic partnership with San Jose is currently held at a net multiple of 1.6 times with a 31% net IRR, up fairly significantly from the end of 2020, which was held at 1.4 times and 24.6% net IRR. So Q1 was positive. Q2 looks like it's going to be a great quarter as well. The financial statements were actually just released um, for San Jose and for Q2, the portfolio again is up about 16% overall. So um, great developments. Um, one point I'll also add here, you'll see 
as of Q1, there were uh, distributions um, at 2 million. Post Q1, we've actually made additional net distributions to your program, um, which totaled over a little over 10 million. So um, in the next two quarters, you'll kind of see that come to play where that 2 million will go up to um, 12 million. So we're really starting to see not only the value of unrealized investments, we're now starting to see the development of realizations um, throughout your portfolio, which is um, exactly where we would expect. We're about four years into the program now. Um, which is typically when we start seeing distributions. I won't spend a lot of time on the next few pages. Um, pages three, four, five, six, and seven. It's all an underlying benchmark for your in fund investments. So you'll see the gross IRR and gross multiple of each underlying investment. And on the right here, you'll see how they are benchmarked against their peers within the same categories. So um, not too much um, has changed here. Um, we, again, we don't benchmark 2020. Those investments are still quite new. Turning to the exposure analysis, this just gives a good idea of how the overall portfolio has been built and, and how it will develop over time. Committed capital are the investments that we have actually committed to to date, and invested capital is the amount of capital that has actually been put into the ground. So the biggest difference you'll see here is on the primaries between committed and invested, simply showing that primaries continue to invest capital over time. And over time, you'll see that the invested pie chart will slowly start to um, take more and look more similar to the committed capital. And you'll see um, the bottom pie charts, um, how the exposure at a geographical basis looks like. Um, we are starting to um, bring down your overall North America exposure. If you'll look on the right, you'll see um, Newberger and the legacy investments. Um, and so over time, again, that will conform more to a little bit more Europe, a little bit more Asia and rest of world. Um, this next page is a performance analysis of the overall uh, program uh, with Newberger. So I would say the biggest um, change here on the very first, at the top of the chart, if you were looking at this um, at the end of 2020, so Q4 2020, all secondaries, primaries, and co-investments, their returns, the gross TVPI are up. So primaries were up um, from 1.35 to 1.39, secondaries up slightly, 1.62, 1.63. And then co-investments actually saw the largest jump where at Q4, it was being held at 1.39 times and at Q1 at 1.68 times. So really the driving force behind some of your um, recent value has been driven by co-investments. And again, we are starting to see realizations within that co-investment portfolio and distributions now coming back to your program. At the bottom, you'll see how the program is performing against benchmarks. So not just what I was showing earlier, which was the underlying investments benchmark, but how your portfolio overall benchmarks um, were on a TVPI basis, um, first quartile and second quartile on the IRR, um, just a little bit there under the 26.45 um, first quartile. So hopefully we'll be able to, to move that up next, next quarter. 
The next slides are very detailed information, um, cash flow information, value information about each underlying investment. Um, I've, I've mentioned co-investments a few times, how they're driving value. Um, I just wanted to mention a specific company um, that might help kind of um, give you an idea of, of what types of co-investments were invested in. Um, at the beginning of 2021, we invested into a company that was acquiring another company. The company was called is called Donuts, and that company was merging with another company called Affilius. Um, some of you might have heard of Donuts before. It is it is not a donut shop. It is actually a technology um, company that's um, they are similar to what you would think of as GoDaddy or one, a company like that where they own and they are a registry operator. So they own um, the domains. So if you think of .com, .org, they're a company that owns that, that, um, that domain. And so um, we saw a lot of value in this company, we really liked the GP we were partnering with. Um, at Q1, the company was held at a one times and at Q2, which you won't see here, but at Q2, that company will be written up to 1.8 times. That's the type of company that's driving your returns. Um, they've seen a lot of organic growth. It's not been necessarily just you know the market's going up, and so the value of this if this company is going up, it's very much driven by the synergies that were produced by combining those two companies, um, the EBITDA synergies, um, and really that the organic plan is ahead of of what it of what the plan was um, year to date. So we're excited about that one. It's still very early on, but. Um, think that will hopefully be a big driver of the portfolio moving forward. So um, I'm going to stop there and um, open up for questions. I, I know that you all have a lot to discuss today, so I'll, I'll um, open it up to anyone with questions. Thanks, Casey. Uh, yeah, floor is open. Anybody have a question? Go ahead and jump in. Usual excellent thorough job. No questions? Anybody? Anything from staff? Nothing. Great. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Prabhu. No, nothing at this point, Mr. Chairman. Great. That's great. Um, thanks, Casey. The next um, three are are yours, um, Laura. Do you want to just take them in sequence? Are, are you on, Laura? Hello. Yes, I think Laura and Jared are both on, uh, Mr. Chairman. So oh, great. Yeah, Laura, go ahead and take it away. You've got um, items um, two B, C, and D. You can just do them all in order, Laura. Hey, this is uh, Jared. I'll start with two C on the uh, private markets report. Um, so I know I'll, I'll go through this quickly and then stop at the end for questions. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, so here's page two of the, uh, the public version of the private markets report. Um, here's a snapshot of page two that we typically start off with. This is a summary of each account type. Uh, and I'll just draw your attention to the far uh, two right columns. You can see the IRR of the plan compared to a public market equivalent. And as you can see, all the way down the board is a pretty favorable comparison. Um, even private debt, which is trailing public market equivalent in the past couple of times we've shown this, is now even. Um, I'd also point out that the 9.9%, nearly 10% IRR for the program as a whole is, uh, is very good on an absolute sense. Uh, to keep moving along, we start with the private debt program overview. Um, this program is about a decade old. Uh, it's mature in the sense of being overweight to policy target. You can see 3.8% versus 3% uh, target. I'd point out a couple quarters ago, the overall weight was 4.9%. So it's come down uh, quite a bit over the past couple of quarters. Um, you know, performance for this group isn't as strong as others. We've noted in the past uh, that there were some 2013, 2013 investments that, that didn't quite work out uh, compared to peers, but, but more recent investments have done quite well. 
On page four, you can see in the last couple of quarters that distributions have been pretty large, especially relative to contributions. Um, and that's part of why the, uh, the current weight has come down. On page six, uh, we have dollar return details for a lot of the strategies here. Um, you know, many funds committed by current staff, like I said, have done well. I'd point out Arbor Lane two here in the middle uh, with an IRR of nearly 30% and almost, almost three times the pure IRR. Um, so very nice results there. To keep moving on, um, here's real assets on page eight. Um, so up to about half of the target weight of 3% with the current weight of one and a half. Um, a very solid IRR here at the bottom. You can see ten, an almost 10% IRR for the program and ahead of peers. Uh, on page nine, you can see this program is still ramping up. So you see the contributions um, far outweigh distributions as this program is building to that 3% target weight. Uh, on page 11, um, there's been several commitments in the past couple of years, but you can see that none of them have meaningful performance. Um, still about half of the total commitment was made in 2016 and on balance, those funds have done well. Um, uh, so the, the top one, especially, but you can see a 10% IRR again, edging out peers uh, for those three put together. So keep moving along. Here's the real estate overview. Um, it's basically near its target, a little bit overweight at 3.4% currently. Um, and to show the, um, the page that shows each individual investment, there's a lot of investments here, so I won't highlight anything in particular unless there's a question. Uh, but I would point out, again, a very strong absolute return uh, IRR here at the bottom, over 11%, and again, edging out peers. And then finally, the last uh, component here is the newer venture capital piece. Uh, you can see it has quite a ways to go to reach the 3% target. So it's at 0.1% currently. Um, and on page 21, the three line items here, uh, the same as, as the last report would have shown. So nothing new since the 4Q report. Um, but these are the funds that are, are basically launching the venture capital program. Um, so I know that was that was fast, but I'll stop there to see if there are any questions. Um, floor is open. If anybody has any questions for Jared, yeah, I'll just jump in and just point out. Uh, it's not a question that uh, the long term performance of you know of these private investments is pretty strong, uh, and I think they're stronger in recent years. Uh, and and these are net of fees, and so I know there's always questions about fees that we pay. Uh, but I think this is a very important component of for us to try to reach that hurdle rate that we set for our, for, our, for ourselves, um, and we should you know stay the course. I'm actually a fan as you know as I did last year to advocate maybe a slight a little extra in this in this asset class. So. Great. Um, any other questions, Laura? Hello. Just wanted to give Jared the limelight for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> All good. Um, Laura, we said go ahead and take um, Jared did um, 2C, right, Jared? Right. Yep. Yep. And, and, and Laura, go ahead and take 2B and 2D um, together. Will do. Okay. So um, looking at the world markets, and I'll be quick like Jared was um, because I know you have some meaty issues to talk about later in your meeting. Um, so taking a look at page four here, you can see the Bloomberg Commodity Index was the top performing major asset class for the second quarter of 2021. That ended up being a very good thing. Um, commodities were recently, um, uh, you know, topped up for this plan. Um, and so um, you see here a strong return for commodities, which, you know, many folks have gotten rid of in recent years that you all have held on to recently for some inflation protection. Um, uh, real estate investment trust also did well, which we see in some of the real estate holdings for your fund. And U.S. equity markets continued their really strong performance, um, up 8.5% for the S&P 500. And on the next slide, you can see that that brings the one-year U.S. equity performance to 40.8%. Um, uh, Russell 2000 value at the bottom of that equity section, small cap value stocks up 73% for the trailing one year. And we do see that the um, investment grade bonds were negative for the year at negative 0.3%. Um, Bloomberg Barclays aggregate, that was because of the interest rate environment, which we've talked about in the past. Um, but other um, fixed income that you hold, like tips um, and high yield and emerging market bonds have done quite well. So it, it has been very good that the plan is diversified into other fixed income asset classes. 
Um, skipping ahead through the rest of the, the market commentary, I'll just take a look at um, the overall asset allocation on page 24. Um, the, um, the plan, despite having net outflows on a cash flow basis, earned um, over uh, almost 300 million in investment gains this third quarter. The second quarter, and you can see here that the current allocation is quite close to um, the policy allocation. Um, total market value at 4.7 billion. Uh, so inching up to that $5 billion mark. Um, and then we take a look on page 25 at performance. And you can see here that for the one year period, the total fund return of 26.3% outperformed all of the plan benchmarks. So if we look at the policy benchmark, the investable benchmark portfolio, the low cost passive portfolio and a 60 40 mix, the total fund performance was ahead of all of those benchmarks. And while 60 basis points ahead of the investable benchmark portfolio might not seem like a ton, that's almost $30 million for the year. So it turned out to be quite a good, um, you know, active management decision there. Um, you can see that most asset classes um, either kept with, up with or outperformed their benchmarks. You know, I mentioned that U.S. equity was up a huge amount for the one-year period. Um, your managers were up even more than the MSCI USA benchmark. Um, that benchmark was up 44%. Your, your managers were up 45 um, And um, I won't go through individual uh, manager performance, but there were some real bright spots, especially in terms of peer relative performance. Um, if we just take a look at a sample on page 31, um, I know that um, some of the trustees, Trustee Menon, have, um, have been interested in seeing more data on, on peer rankings. If we look here um, for the one year period, for example, at this um, RWC Emerging Markets Equity here in the 10th percentile with an almost 60% return for the one year period. Um, if we look at some other um, groups, like for example, um, Wellington and Guazu, which is on page 39, we can see that this is you know, a manager that doesn't always shoot the lights out on the upside. So you see here a one year peer rank quite near the bottom in the 96th percentile, even though they had a 5.4% positive return. But then if we look at the five-year period and since inception, you see a first percentile rank. Um, so it's interesting to sort of look at these, these swings um, in peer ranks, um, but in general, the, uh, the active managers in the plan have added a lot of value recently. If we look at page 46, um, at the bottom line, we can see the cash flows. So you can see that um, 726 million came into the plan, 787 million flowed out. So you see sort of a, a negative cash flow environment like we typically see for a mature plan. Um, but you do see that investment earnings for just the three months ended June 30th were 273 million. Um, I'll point out just looking, you know, we like to look at risk adjusted performance as well. If we take a look at page 53, we can see here that the, uh, the annualized return on the left um, was slightly behind, um, uh, nearly in line with the peer median. Um, we look at an annualized standard deviation, which was below the peer median, so less risk to earn that return. We look at the SHARP ratio, which was a measure of risk-adjusted return, which was close to median. And then the Sortino ratio only measures um, downside deviation. So it's another measure of risk-adjusted return. Um, you know, it's sort of going along with the thought that, you know, you, you probably want deviation on the upside. Um, you know, volatility isn't a bad thing if you're outperforming the benchmark. So really, we should look more at, you know, what kind of volatility you had um, when in periods where the benchmark was underperformed. And you can see here that the Sertino ratio is, um, is well above really everyone else in the peer group. Um, if we look at long-term um, metrics as well, um, I'll look at the three-year on page 54. Here we see an above median return, a well below median risk, um, and a um, top quartile sharp ratio and Sertino ratio. So really great risk adjusted metrics for the long term. And so I can answer any questions on the uh, on the pension report or just roll right into healthcare. Floor is open. Uh, if anybody has any questions. Yeah, if I may jump jump in here, Drew. Um, Couple of questions, Laura. So um, if you go to page uh, uh, page 25, um, so the growth performance is 38.4 versus the growth benchmark of 
And I was trying to figure out where that difference comes from. And it looks like on private equity, you know, very strong performance, but uh, the benchmark was quite a bit higher. Uh, is that a timing difference in terms of uh, looking at our performance one quarter behind? Um, but that's a big difference, 43.2 versus 52.1. Yeah, um, all private equity um, partnerships are going to report on slightly different um, uh, okay. time bases. So it is difficult to sort of look at shorter term and, you know, one year still being shorter term in sort of the private market world. So that's correct. Okay, and maybe that resolves. So that's not that's not a real number, you think? Um, I mean, I think it's it's a real number. I mean, obviously, um, forty three point two is nothing to to sneeze at, but this is also a time weighted return. Yeah. Um, really, you know, time weighted is affected quite a bit by just you know which day a cash flow came in or out. So yeah. we really prefer to evaluate the private market's performance on a longer term basis and also on an IRR basis, like um, like in the private markets report that Gerald uh, that Jared discussed, and also the SEC message from from you. Okay, you're, fa you're fading a bit. With a grain of salt on private markets. Okay, uh, second, uh, Prabhu and I were you know, discussing the Sortini ratio. So for the one year period, um, you know, which is a short period. So I guess, uh, are you looking at monthly returns? And what if you go through a year when you really don't have you know, many down months, right? It's because you, you're saying you're looking at the standard deviation when returns are negative. Um, how would you do something for a short period uh, to get a meaningful number for the Sortina ratio? That's a very good question. And um, we would need to take a look at our, our data provider and find out exactly the calculation method that they're using for the Sortino uh, ratio in terms of, of monthly performance. Okay, yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, that's no problem. Uh, that's all I had to. Thanks for this. Any other questions? Floor is open. I had a question, this is Sunita. Um, so I, maybe this gets discussed in the investment committee, if so you can table this. Um, but I'm curious, uh, you, you mentioned, I didn't quite understand what you talked about in the managers flipping from 1% one, 1 style to another, but uh, I'm just curious at a, at a higher level, uh, what in a, in a bull market like this, uh, what do we have any attribution analysis around how many managers outperformed in the public markets versus underperform the benchmark? And how do we weed out underperforming managers? Um, so one of the ways that the city has tried to um, to keep a, you know, sort of an eye on, or, or the plans, I guess, with the, uh, the city's um, urging after audits uh, in the past is the watch list, which we have in, um, in the, uh, the earlier materials. And I apologize for not stopping on the page, page 20. Um, is a watch list where we look at managers that have underperformed for the three or five year period. So we're trying to look at a full market cycle just since, you know, that, that I was trying to sort of get at that point with Wellington and Guazu that, you know, the short term, a manager can look like they're not doing that great. But then you look at the full performance history and they've really added a lot of value relative to sort of the passive index um, for the plan. So right now there's only one manager that is underperforming um, for the three or the five year period. And that's dimensional emerging markets value. Um, and we we sort of, if you look at the next slide, um, we, we talk about it a bit more, but um, that they've outperformed since inception, um, but have not done all that well relative to peers and have underperformed um, for the three year period. So this is sort of just um, where we call out any manager that's not doing well and make sure that we and staff understand why that is. Um, and in the case of dimensional, they're using a really different um, uh, methodology um, in terms of holding a lot of stocks. It's a relatively low cost portfolio and they're um, you know, investing in a different way than the other emerging markets managers. And so therefore we think for diversification purposes, it makes sense to hold on to them. Uh, but this is where we, you would find managers were concerned about from a performance basis. Okay, that's helpful. So is this a, like a rolling three year? Like you look at it every quarter, but it's sort of a rolling. So period. yes, we look every quarter and we look at the annualized three-year numbers. So the average annual return for the manager relative to the average annual return for the benchmark over the past three years. I mean, I'm, I'm blown away that this is one manager who's underperforming. Good job. Yeah, no, I, I think, um, you know, we talked, um, we, there was a deep dive in the investment committee meeting recently um, 
on um, on the public equity portfolio. And um, and you know, we Nikita commented that you know this this is a really strong portfolio right now. It is rare to see so many managers, and and there's really you know we do see sometimes a portfolio where say you know, all the managers have a growth bias and growth has done really well recently. And so they're outperforming, but this is a portfolio where you really do have a diversified portfolio in our opinion um, that has, you know, been really well constructed and, and is doing well. Yeah, and if I can add, thank you for the question, uh, Trustee Sunita. It's, if we do look at, as Laura said, you know, over a full market cycle and we do like our managers to be long-term partners. So as long as we have conviction in their process and the team stays intact, we may actually persist with the manager for a long time. And we also look at correlation of alpha. And so some, some, someone might underperform in the short term, but if they have uncorrelated alpha in the grand scheme of things on a risk adjusted basis, they're still adding value. But that is something that we closely monitor. Thank you for the detailed response, appreciate it. That's it for me. Thanks, Nidia. The floor is still open. Any other questions? You're doing great, Laura. Keep going. All right. Thank you. Um, all right. On page 22 of the healthcare report um, that we have up here, you can see the total current value, uh, value at just under $250 million and very close to these current allocations, which, as you know, you all um, modified um, during the past year, and that, um, that turned out to be a good decision um, as um, moving more towards equity has been, a, you know, sort of a, a good thing for this plan. If you look at the one year return on the next slide, you can see it's at 24%. Um, that's slightly behind the policy benchmark, but almost double the peer group. Um, and as we've talked about in the past, the peer group um, for health and welfare plans tends to be pretty conservative. A lot of times there's a lower expected return for health plans than there is for a pension. Um, in this case, your expected return is quite close to that of the pension. And so this plan takes some more risk than a lot of the peers, but that's certainly paid off with um, a return for the one year in the um, top quartile um, the quarter and the year to date periods are in the top quartile as well. And as you know, um, the managers in this plan, you know, near sort of many of the uh, liquid public managers on um, the pension trust. Um, you do have core real estate in this plan, which is on page 26. And that's also been um, a positive looking at BlackRock and Clarion, um, both of them outperforming. And then if we take a look at page 27, continuing to hold commodities in this plan, it's been a bit of a bumpy ride. If you look at since inception, commodities have been slightly down um, over that long time period. But in the recent past, looking at the one year period, you see commodities up almost 38%. Um, so a very strong return for that that portion of the plan on an absolute basis. I'd be happy to take any questions on healthcare. Great. Thanks, Laura. Floor is open. Any questions? Uh, if not, let me note for the record, we received um, one presentation from Casey Newberg Berman and three from Jared and Laura at Makita, and we um, will file those. Great. Um, hey, Roberto, let, let's do um, the FLSA and the break. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm just trying to check if Cheryl Parkman oh. is uh, have joined the meeting. Um, Cheryl is oh. not only uh, an assistant to the city manager and our city council liaison, I see Randy Perry from the city manager's office. Uh, join us, Randy. I'm not sure if you or Cheryl will be presenting this item to the board. Can you please let us know? Yes, <clears throat> it's going to be Cheryl. She is doing double duty right now, so I will let her know that it's time for her to join us. All right. Thank you very much. In any, uh, in any event, uh, while we get Cheryl uh, on board, I just wanted to share with the board um this uh, this item which um if you got a chance to uh, read the memo is well explained in the memo it was deferred from your meeting last month august 5th as far as i understand it's just uh clarifying a, a definition of the flsa premium pay so uh to those of you out there from the uh, uh plan members from the uh, um, police and uh, and the uh, uh, firefighter um, will understand this better than I do. 
but as far as I understand, it's a straightforward um, item and it's just a clarification. So, um, but certainly once um, the city has a chance to uh, present it, uh, please feel free, not just you, but any other trustee or the public in general to ask any questions. Uh, We're still waiting for Cheryl, so if you just bear with us for a couple of uh, minutes, uh, we'll be right with you. I wonder, um, Mr. Yeah, Chair, what- Roberto, maybe you guys can go on to the next item, um, and then was, we'll get we'll get a better timeline from Cheryl when she can jump on. Okay, so yeah, I was gonna suggest, Mr. Chair, that we could do the aura update from the CEO and the city council liaison. And I was going to suggest that you allow the city council to go first. Uh, also, because I believe um, she's aware that we had a commendation for Trustee Vincent Seri this morning. And I believe that in addition to her aura update, she wanted to get a chance to uh, make a few comments on the commendation. So um, I, with that, I'll just turn it over to you, Mr. Chair. Oh, Drew, you're muted. <laughs> Thanks, Pam. I love talking to myself. It makes me feel <laughs> So Roberto and I have been going back, forth in the background. Um, so items 4C and 4F are all pension obligation bonds. We will start um, Bill's presentation time certain at 1030. So the city can start time certain 1130. We asked Bill, Bill said maybe an hour, maybe less. The bills will last well of a break and bills will more. I think the city will want to hear what he has to say anyway. So why don't we go ahead and do is we're going to suggest so let's do you first, Pam, 4B, then we're to next 4A, unless we have Cheryl, and then we'll do Cheryl last 3A. So go ahead, Pam, over to you. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'll, I'll be brief. I'm sorry I missed the commendations earlier on for Vince, and boy, do I miss that man. He uh, was a tremendous, I'm sure you all said this, so I'll probably be repeating what you all said. He is knowledgeable. He helped drive the pension board to where it is today with you, Drew, and uh, many others who are still around. Uh, but beyond that, he I consider him a mentor. Before I ran for city council, I'll share with you that I sat down with him about the pension board and unfunded liabilities and and he really gave me a, a retirement board one on 101 on everything I needed to know. And by no means do I know everything for sure, but it his training and, and mentorship has really been invaluable to me. And I count him as a dear friend. So I miss him on this board, but I know I'll be able to see him again. He was an inspiration and so smart in everything he did. And I'm sorry that he had to um, resign from this board and I know he was disappointed too, but you know, new opportunities for him, sad for us. Um, so Vince, we love you. Um, other, the un only other thing I wanted to update you about as it relates to the city is that we did approve a vaccine ordinance a couple of weeks ago that will require anyone who enters into one of our public, our city owned facilities where attendance is expected to be 50 or more that they must be vaccinated. There is no exemption for uh, a negative COVID test but we are considering exemptions for religious or medical reasons. So uh, we had a long city council meeting to discuss this. It was unanimous to support it. Uh, the Delta variant, as you all know, is very serious and we're taking it into consideration and trying to protect our community as much as possible. Uh, I want to make it really clear that we are not discussing a vaccine passport at all. This is just about entering our building. So if you want to enter uh, City Hall for a, a chambers meeting and we have 50 people present, you'll need to show proof of vaccination. Same thing with sharks and other some of our facilities, but it is limited currently to our facilities. And, and with that, I will conclude my report. I look forward to the... It discussion on the pension obligation bonds, though. 
Yeah, it's going to be a live one. Thanks, Ben. Those are very eloquent words you said for Vince. So I, I had said earlier in my comments, and I'm sure you'd echo them, that my motto in life is if we're not having fun, we're doing it wrong. And by God, we had a lot of fun with Vince. <laughs> He's a great guy. Um, any comments or questions for Councilwoman Foley? Uh, if not, over to you, Roberto. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so a couple of, uh, if you bear with me, a couple of issues. I think I'm going to um, follow up on, on the comments by uh, Councilmember Foley on, on the city return to on-site work. Um, this is a very fluid situation. And, and you know, there's a two stage. <clears throat> um, they, I think at a prior meeting, um, I have mentioned uh, the goal of that uh, of that process, which he, he started with the uh, the verification for vaccination or the COVID te uh, testing by August twenty uh, third. That was stage one of the of the process, and they also initially had um, indicated a possible uh, October first day to start having uh, most of the staff coming back to the office. Um, because of the Delta variant recently, they have pushed that day to November 1st. And if we get closer, meaning the day to return to on-site work by, uh, by staff of the city in general. And uh, they were very clear, however, that given the challenges of the Delta variant uh, and uh, this situation is very fluid, they certainly will uh, continue managing uh, uh, the situation and as we get closer to that day they will provide further information of whether november 1st is going to be the day or whether they feel they have to be pushing that forward a little further um, i also wanted to share that the stage two uh, program um, uh, this means that any employee as of september 30th 2021 has not verified that they are vaccinated they will have to then provide either a, a reason for not uh, being vaccinated, uh, whether it's medical or a religious exception. And they will also have to, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, as part of the stage one, also have the negative COVID test uh, on a weekly basis. Although, if you do not provide any of, of these exceptions, again, either medical or religious for being vaccinated, then the employee could be subject to formal, formal disciplinary action um, whether that's suspension or anything else, including up to termination if it's warranted. So I just wanted to keep uh, the board apprised. We in the Office of Retirement Services try very hard to keep track and, and sort of match to the extent possible the, the, the city goals on the COVID-19 uh, um, coming back to the office. Um, you should know, and I think I have kept uh, you apprised, that we do have from time to time staff um, that uh, do go to the office. Uh, it's a, a skeleton uh, group, uh, meaning that it's no more than two people or three at a time. In fact, I don't know if you can tell that Prabhu is actually at his office this morning. And so, um, but you know, I'm assuming along with Prabhu, we may not have more than three or four staff at the office at this time. So we will, we will continue doing so. And I will keep you apprised when we issue communication to our staff, uh, we have made the point the last couple of times to also keep uh, both boards, chairs and vice chairs apprised of the situation. So even though we don't include the full board, we're keeping both the chair and vice chair apprised. And ultimately, when we do start the process of going back to the office, I think I've been um, upfront on our goal of, of putting together a hybrid approach, meaning that it will not be a situation where the staff will all go back to the office. We're certainly going to scatter that, and we're not going to request that everyone come back to the office at the same time. So um, we are going to try to make sure that we keep CDC requirements in terms of not only using the mask, but also keeping uh, a distance among employees. So uh, suffice to say, the situation is fluid and we will keep you posted as it develops. And the last couple of things I wanna share with you is we concluded recruitment for uh, the, one of the benefit analyst position. And uh, the, uh, the new analyst will start working uh, at our office on Monday, September 20th. She comes from uh, the city uh, another city department, so um, um, 
you know, the details, I don't have them with me right now, but we look forward to having them. As soon as we have the details, we'll make sure that we introduce her at your next meeting. We receive the annual actuary request for the 2021 valuation data. Um, uh, in the next month, we will make sure that we provide you a, a timeline on the uh, valuation work. And the reason for that is not only do we provide you a timeline every year, but I want to remind you that we started five years ago with having uh, an actuarial audit uh, for both pensions and healthcare. And the first one was completed with the June 30th, 2016 valuation. And the second one uh, will be uh, done with the June 30th, 2021 valuation. So there's going to be more work and uh, more discussions uh, in the next few uh, months uh, at your board, uh, mostly from Kyron, but uh, you may recall that the uh, actual audit firm Seagull will also be coming before you with their results uh, later in the year. So again, we'll, we'll keep you posted. We'll provide you the timeline so that you know what to expect. Um, and lastly, I want to remind you, um, Drew indicated, so we do have four items this, uh, at this meeting on POB. Uh, we still have our federal board meeting on September 23rd. I want to remind you that we do have the joint meeting of the boards with the city council. It is scheduled for Thursday, September 30th from 1.30 to 4.30. The agenda has not been finalized. But again, um, I know Linda sent all of you out a calendar, save the date. Again, it's Thursday, September 30th from 1.30 to 4.30. It will be a virtual meeting. And as soon as the agenda is finalized, we'll make it available to all of you. So with that, Mr. Chair, that concludes my comments and I'm happy to answer any questions. Let me, let me go first, Roberto. So um, I know we had issues with short staffing, both in management and worker bees in, in benefits. Does this now bring you to full staffing or do you still have some openings? We still have some openings. Uh, thank God, Barbara is at the meeting. I'm going to guess for sure we have uh, at least one, if not two openings left, but let me turn that over to Barbara so you can answer that. Barbara, can you answer that question? Please. Yes, we have three uh, staff specialists vacant in um, in the benefits group. Um, and then I think there's two vacant positions in our investments group. Whew, that's a lot. That's a fill. Thanks, Barbara. Floor's open. Any questions for Roberto? Yeah, Roberto, um, just a couple of questions. So the September 30th, is that a virtual meeting? Yes, it is a virtual meeting. Yes, correct. Okay. And the plan for future board meetings, do we continue virtual? Um, well, so that's a good question. I'm, I'm glad you raised that. Um, and I know council, I believe they said the meeting. So as of right now, the, the law that allow the flexibility to continue these virtual meetings runs out after September 30th. Um, I don't know, and I haven't really heard any updates on that um, i have asked council to keep a surprise so that we can then apprise the board but uh, suffice to say that if that flexibility of the law is not extended past september 30th the expectation is that starting with october 1st uh, public meetings will be um, required to be uh, in physical attendance and again, as we find out more about it as well, we will let you know. Um, uh, Harvey Omaytak, if you are available, could you comment on that? Yeah, there has been no change uh, yet from the governor's office. Uh, frankly, I wouldn't anticipate anything before the recall election coming <laughs> down, but shortly after that's resolved, I imagine under the circumstances that that will be continued, but we have nothing other than a hard stop on these virtual meetings right now as of September 30th. So Javi, it's a, it's a state decision, not a city decision? Yeah, it's a state decision because it's a suspension of the state Brown Act or open meeting laws. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions for Roberto? Uh, if not, hi, Cheryl. Hi, Drew. 
it's nice to see you and, and my sincere apologies for being late to this meeting. This is one of those days where you can never tell uh, what time you <laughs> will be in one place or the other, but I appreciate the board's flexibility while waiting. You're fine, Cheryl. This one was not on you. This is one of those rare times we're running ahead of schedule. So you're actually <laughs> right on time. We are the ones, the trains are running on time today, uh, just probably due to no one's fault. That's a good thing. <laughs> Over to you, item um, 3A, um, FLSA. Thank you so much. So the item that's before this board today is an ordinance that is really seeking to clarify some of the language around compensation. So as the memo details for this board. That... Cheryl, can you, Cheryl, can you hold on for a second? Can I ask staff to bring the memo to the screen? Oh, sure. So uh, Cheryl, speak to it. Um, I'm sorry, we can uh, we can actually um, see the memo. I don't know if that's you, Cheryl, or it's our staff who can bring it up. I'm not really sure who, but I think that would be helpful. Uh, yeah. Thanks, if, thanks. Linda, if you need me to bring it up, I, I absolutely can. If you just give me one second in order to uh, oh, share. So Michelle just, just did that for you, Cheryl. Oh, yeah. perfect. Thanks, Cheryl. Okay, that's great. Okay, thank you so much, Michelle. I appreciate it. So. This is a very quick uh, municipal code change that really relates to a 2018 city auditor report where the city auditor was just seeking for the city to clarify a couple of different definitions in the uh, municipal code related to compensation. So these definitions relate to FLSA premium pay, and it's not changing anything for any of our bargaining units. It's just clarifying the language based on our MOAs with our unions. So I'm here today uh, based on our municipal code uh, uh, obligation to come to the board when we do change anything in our retirement chapters uh, to ask for the board's comments and questions regarding uh, these municipal code changes. I do not have a, an expedited timeline for once for these municipal code changes. So, uh, you know, if your board's council needs to take these changes back, review them and let me know what they uh, what they think if they're going to recommend that there are no comments or questions, uh, we can we can utilize that time to do so. Um, I do want to point out that we did provide these changes to uh, local 230 and the POA, and they did not have any comments or questions when we did provide them uh, this. So at this time, we're just asking for comments from from the board or from board's council in order to uh, then move forward with our next steps, which is taking these municipal code changes to city council. Uh, thanks, um, Cheryl. Um, any the floor is open. Any comments from any trustees? Uh, uh, Drew, I, I got a question for Cheryl. Sure. Um, uh, Cheryl, so I heard a couple comments that you made, and I just want to just confirm what I heard. Um, you did reach out to the unions um, and, and provided the language change. Um, and then also I heard that the language change that you really pretty much just picked up from the MOA um, and put it in here, right? Absolutely. This does not make any changes to any, any compensation. This is only clarifying what the agreements with the unions already say. So this is, again, from an auditor's report that just seeks to clarify some of the language. As many of you have read a lot of Unicode uh, uh, language throughout the years, it can be it can be vague, it can be general. We're just seeking to make sure that everyone is on the same page when it comes to these definitions. All right, thank you. Thanks. Uh, hey, Harvey, go ahead, jump in. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and thanks to Cheryl for getting this to us uh, early in advance. It's great. We've had a chance to take a look at it. It, 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 it is not, a, on its face, it's not a substantive change in any of our benefit structures or how we calculate uh, pensionable compensation. Uh, so I would uh, recommend that the board uh, need not uh, issue any comments or recommendations back to the city on it. Uh, it's a it's anytime the city wants to clarify the municipal code is a great day. And uh, so, so we, uh, we encourage uh, this kind of clarity. So thank you. But before I open up to trustees again, Harvey, it says discussion and action. Are you suggesting we don't need a motion on this? Yes, that's what I'm suggesting. Right. Um, floors open. Any other questions or comments? I, I don't have a 
question. Well, I guess I do have a sort of a question slash comment, uh, Cheryl, that I guess based on the discussion, and if there are no comments from the board, that's all you would need. You don't need anything in writing to let you know we have no comments. This will be good enough and you can take it from here. Absolutely. If, if, okay. if that's what's happening, what will happen then is we will proceed with moving to the city council portion of our action. I believe if I understood all the conversation that took place, that's exactly what's happening. <laughs> Very good. Um, any other questions or comments from the floor? Um, if not, let me ask, are there any objections from the floor? Um, if not, I think we'll follow the uh, council uh, leaderman's recommendation. We've received this, Cheryl. Looks like everything's in order, um, and we will file it. Uh, many thanks to the board for your flexibility and for the conversation today. Uh, always a pleasure to see you, Cheryl. And you'll be seeing me back again at 1130. <laughs> uh, yeah. Hey, well, and just, you know, Cheryl, we're going to start that at 1030 with um, uh, the presentation. Oh, okay. Kyra. So, and Bill's put a lot of work into this. I think you guys will get a lot of that. I know we will. Um, all right, thanks, Cheryl. So we're going to skip over for C and F and start those at time certain 1030 in 25 minutes. And we'll take a five minute break before then. And we're going to skip over items 4 G and H because I don't want to have to cut those short. Um, so let's go to 4 I. Um, Linda, can you pull up the um, 4 I, the board committee assignments? So I, I, again, apologies to the board for, this is on me not getting this out um, in time uh, for the package. I did discuss these changes with everyone. So um, everyone take a look. Is there anything here that's wrong? Everybody agreed to these assignments? And I apologize for the scramble. Obviously Vince's departure left us scrambling uh, quickly to fill the vacancies that he left behind. Uh, do, do I, I so, do I need to call for a motion to approve this, Roberto? Yes, Mr. Chair, please. Um, uh, uh, I will entertain a motion to approve these committee assignments. There's a motion by Santos. Do I have a second? I'll second it, be sure. Uh, let's go around the deck. Um, Andrew? Aye. Uh, Sunita? Aye. Uh, Eshvar. Aye. Uh, Dick? Yes. Franco? Aye. Uh, Dave? Aye. And I vote aye as well. These are committee assignments. Um, that next time, that, that's Ray, oh, that is Ray Storms. Hey, Andrew, go ahead and text Ray and let him know we're in a little early and we'll take him whenever he wants to get on board. Okay. That, that's not, it's not a long item, right, Andrew? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Chair, I'm sorry. Um, Ray emailed a little bit earlier and said that he'll be able to join the meeting after 11. Okay. Uh, great. Great. Um, that that's good. So so we'll hold. I, mean, I got this running list of of things I'm holding. Um, so that's item four, J. Yeah, that's fine. I appreciate it. Yeah, you too, Cheryl. I appreciate everybody's patience. As we juggle this, that that block in the POB is, gosh, probably two or three hours long. So we're juggling around that. Um, uh, Roberto, are you going to do item four K on on uh, James Mason? Yeah, I can kick it off, and then the, I'll ask Council who drafted the memo to comment on it. I just want to make sure. I apologize. I was trying to respond to someone. Um, was there a motion for the committee assignments and we all said with that? Yeah, we had a motion and second and it was unanimous by all. Okay, very good. All right, very well. Yeah, thank you. So um, in any case, um, we did receive a disability application uh, from a, a police member. Um, the police member, James Mason, was actually a trustee of your board uh, when I first joined your board in 2013, uh, it escaped me for how long he was a trustee, but I think he was a trustee even when you joined in 2011, uh, Drew, and he was a trustee for a few years. 
And uh, in any event, he is actually now, uh, I believe, retiring uh, for service, but at the same time also filing a service-connected disability. Uh, I discussed the matter with uh, your general counsel, uh, and I felt that it was appropriate for us to recommend to your board to consider having a third party uh, um, actually consider this disability application and have that third party then uh, forward to you a recommendation that, that then your board will ultimately make a decision on whether or not to accept that recommendation. But again, it will be a neutral retirement system. It will not be you. And uh, it, it will also deal with any potential issues of conflict of interest, given the fact that he was a former trustee of the board. And although I recognize that the only trustee that is left that actually had the chance to serve with a trustee Mace, former trustee Mason is trustee Lanza. Uh, I still think that is, and actually also trustee Santos, I still believe is, is the right approach to take. Uh, in closing, I do wanna mention you did have a, a prior situation that was similar to this uh, some 11 years ago, not quite the same. It was somewhat similar from the standpoint that you did receive uh, a disability application, but at the time, the trustee was actually trustee of your board. Um, it was not a former trustee like it's in this case, uh, but even then the trustee did resign to his trusteeship seat uh, at the board meeting in anticipation of, of the board uh, considering uh, the application request. So uh, again, the bottom line here is um, uh, there are no requirements in the municipal code, but I think that that's, this is the appropriate take uh, step to take to limit any potential conflict of interest. And that's what we are recommending that you board approve uh, uh, moving forward to designate a neutral retirement system. And with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Harvey as your general counsel to comment on his memo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Richard. Go ahead, Harvey. Yeah, thank you. Um, this is very typical of the boards that I represent up and down the state. When, whenever there's a situation like this, particularly a board member, um, it's just considered good form and good um, and it, Good way to assure the public of a level playing field for, for all members and that we take any potential or even the appearance of uh, bias um, out of considerations of these kind of disability applications. Very typical among systems to look to a neighboring system to make a recommendation. This board will still have the, uh, the final decision. But just as uh, the board acts on the recommendations in the ordinary course of the disability committee, uh, this is essentially uh, finding an independent disability committee to make the recommendation as to the factual findings of service connection and permanent incapacity. Um, so just as uh, in the ordinary course, uh, I'd like to, you know, for most systems, uh, when, when an application from a board member or for other reasons come up, um, we generally look to sister systems. They're, they're, most of the other systems, whether at the county level uh, or city level, um, are used to doing this as a courtesy. I don't know if, I can't remember if San Jose has done it for a neighboring system before, uh, but this is very much in the mainstream of maintain the integrity of the system. It's not a comment in any way, shape, or form on the on the um, on the application itself or the, or the uh, outcome. Thanks, Harvey. Uh, let me make a comment. So I was there along with Dick when we did have that vote a little less than a decade ago. And it was awkward. It's awkward to um have a and by the, and back then we did not yet have the disability committee. The whole board heard it. And it was an active trustee, it was awkward. So Harvey's right, this is just basic good hygiene. Um, floor's open, any questions or comments? Um, if not, I'll make the motion that we accept Harvey's recommendation and refer um, uh, James Mason's um, application um, outside of our system and, and leave that up to, um, uh, I guess, 
Can we just leave it up to you, Roberto, to coordinate that? Yeah, yeah, we will coordinate that. I um, I don't recall the specifically the memo. Uh, I believe that one of the suggestions was the county of San Mateo. No. And I actually already had a conversation with my counterpart at the county of San Mateo in the event that you bore uh, approve this request so that um, uh, we, we can reach out to them first. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Great. So, so I'm, great. So motion made by Lansing by Santos. Andrew? Aye. Uh, Sunita? Aye. Eshvar? Aye. Eck? Yes. Go. Aye. Dave? Aye. And uh, this is Chair Lanza. I vote aye as well. Uh, that was item 4K. Um, let's let's uh, keep going. We will take uh, a five minute break, 10 minutes from now. Um, we'll vote on the retirements and we'll have a moment of silence for those that have passed. Uh, let's see, the service department of Russell V. Davis, fire engineer, fire department effective September 18, 2021, 25.18 eight years of service. Uh, Edward Dorsey, police officer, police department, effective September 17, 2021, 25.03 years service. David Ennis, battalion chief, fire department effective October 3rd, uh, 2021, 31.71 31.71 years service uh, with reciprocity um, all over the place. Uh, PERS, um, SG Sarah, and CSJ. Well, all right, CSJ. Uh, we are not improving. Uh, do we approve, we go ahead and approve his retirement? Uh, we approved the yes. retirement, James R. Mason, police sergeant, police department effective October 2nd, 2021, 29.4, three years service uh, with reciprocity. Uh, Derek Parmer, fire captain, fire department effective October 3rd, 2021, 31.26 years service um, with reciprocity. Um, uh, let's go ahead. Do we have a motion for those service retirements? Motion by Santos. Second by Gardner. Motion by Santos, second by Gardner. Let's go around for the vote. Andrew? Aye. Anita? Aye. Ashfar? Aye. Beck? Yes. Franco? Aye. Dave? Aye. And I'm Chair Lanza. I vote that's unanimous. I, I forget, Roberto, I always forget every time. Do we need to vote on deferred vested and early? We need to vote on early retirement. Do we need to vote on deferred vested? Yes, please, yes. Right, let's take these one time then so it's clear. Uh, deferred vested, Richard J. Benitez, Benitez Jr., Police Sergeant, Police Department, Effective September 6th, 2021, with 20.07 years of service. Do I have a motion to approve that? Motion by Santos. By Santos, we have a second. A second by Gardner. I motion by Santos, second by Gardner, uh, going around for the vote. Andrew? Aye. Uh, Sunita? Aye. Ashwar? Aye. Uh, Dick? Yes. Nico? Aye. Dave? Aye. And Chair Lanza, I vote aye. Final deferred vested, uh, I'm sorry, final early retirement, sorry. Uh, Cassidy D. Ellisher, Police Officer, Police Department Effective, October 2nd, 2021, 24.33 years service. I'm with reciprocity. Do I have a motion to approve? Yes, by Santos. Motion by Santos. Do I have a second? Second by Dave. Second by Dave. Going around the room, Andrew? Aye. Uh, Sunita? Aye. Uh, Ashfar? Aye. Uh, Dick? Yes. Uh, Franco? Aye. Dave? Aye. And I vote mm -hmm. aye as well. Um, I don't know, um, uh, Dick, Andrew, uh, Franco, um, Dave, do you guys want to say anything about any of these people? Well, for Santos, I worked with them and uh, it's some uh, just sad to see they didn't get a chance to enjoy their retirement. They went too soon. All of them, it's very sad. I worked with all of them. so. Uh, the best of our families in their service. Great. Um, anything from anyone else? Yeah, this is Gardner. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I worked with all those, all these firefighters and battalion chiefs. Uh, they're wonderful people. Um, they are going to be missed. Thank you for your service and enjoy your retirement. Anything from you, Frank or Dave? Yeah, I, they, uh, 
looks like for our side, they retired before I uh, came on. So I wish the best to their families. And uh, God bless. That's great. Um, I'll now read um, um, the folks that, that have passed in one moment of silence. Notification of the death of Stephen F. Alvarado, Division Chief, retired September 13, 2014. Died July 2nd, 2021, survivorship benefits to Terry Alvarado's spouse, spouse. Sorry. Notification of the death of Fred J. Esparza, police officer, retired January 15th, 1994. Died January 7th, 2021, no survivorship benefits. Notification of the death of James Hart, police officer, retired December 3rd, 1969. Died June 22nd, 2021. That's a nice long retirement. No survivorship benefits. Notification of the death of Danny R. Holmes, fire engineer, retired May 14th, 1978. Died July 5th, 2021. Survivorship benefits to Katie, Kathy Holmes, spouse, sorry, Kathy. Notification of the death of John Trussler, police sergeant, retired January 16th, 1993. Died July 1st, 2021. Survivorship benefits to Christine Trussler's spouse. We'll now have a moment of silence. I know Dick's already spoken about these people. Any thoughts from you, Andrew or Franco or Dave? Yeah, same thing with, you know, Dick was saying, um, lives were cut way too short. Um, I've worked with uh, uh, Chief Alvarado, um, and he was actually uh, a training officer when I came on. He's only, he's only been retired for about six, seven years. Um, so he's definitely going to be sorely missed um, and condolences to the family and condolences to everybody else that um, lost a loved one. Thanks. Um, any comments, Frank or Dave? Yeah, from Dave. Uh, I didn't have the chance to work with any of these guys. They retired before I was hired, but it looks like uh, they had a good long retirement, good long careers, and uh, God bless to their, their families and friends that are going to miss them. That's great. Um, let's uh, go ahead and pick up um, as good as far into the committee as we can get in the next five minutes. Um, investment Drew? committee. Um, Drew, go ahead. Yes, please. Um, rather than splitting the committees, I think this is a good time to take a eight minute break and that take us to about 1030 and we can come back and kick it up. I mean, I'll, I'll defer it to you, but I'm just thinking rather than having to uh, go quickly through some comments. I uh, Maybe we want to consider taking a break and then come back at 10.30. What do you think? I think that's great. We're doing, okay, we're going to take a break. So I've got, um, I'm on the East Coast, so I got to do math in my head. <laughs> <laughs> 122, yeah, you have 122. Your time, somewhere out here, it's afternoon. Um, let's take an eight minute break and resume at uh, 10.30. Thanks, Roberto. So you go all in eight minutes.
hear from from Bill and Ann with Chiron or actuaries. Um, then we'll hear from the city on pension. This is all on pension obligation bonds, POBs. And then um, we'll hear from uh, uh, our, our wise counsel, Harvey. And then finally, I will try to frame the debate for us. I, it's an unusual step for the chairman, but there's so many moving parts. I thought it might be kind of helpful to have a symphony conductor. So let, let, let's pull back and ask kind of where, where we are in space and time, which is actually the title of my first slide. So the city has been talking about pension obligation bonds for like a decade. You'll hear that in their presentation. But starting last year, and you saw Cheryl earlier, they kicked off a pretty big study session. We were part of that. Andrew was on the committee. I was briefly. Um, Vince was on there as well. And so they started to get a little more serious when that wrapped up in the spring. And we've reacted to that in a four-step process. And today is the, the third step of that. The first step was June. We heard from Bill and Ann from Chiron. And then in August, we heard from McKeith and Barris on pension obligation bonds. And now at this meeting, we're going to try to pull all these pieces together. That will be my presentation. And then, as Roberto said, later this month, we're going to meet with the city to discuss this. And so, starting a, a year and a half ago, the city got pretty serious. Now they've got us engaged, and we're doing our part of the dance. And ultimately, this might lead in, in next year or the year after the city actually issuing um, pension obligation bonds. And of course, our brethren over on the federated side are doing the same dance, and they'll, they'll be um, um, discussing um, uh, their thing at, at their board meeting uh, in a couple in a couple of weeks. So without further ado, let me um, turn it over to uh, Chiron. Take it away, Bill and Ann. Thank you, Drew. Uh, hopefully, everyone can see my screen. We wanted to uh, start this presentation just putting. Uh, what we're gonna present in the context of the overall POB discussion. Uh, by looking at the roles that the retirement board plays and the city plays and, as we understand them. And so the, the retirement board is responsible for the investment of the assets and the investment policy. And you're going through an analysis of that and how a POB might, might affect that decision. We are also responsible for setting the actuarially determined contribution. And so we set that based on the assumptions uh, that we develop uh, and then the methods. And in particular, when we're looking at the impact of a POB, the amortization methods become critical uh, to what the impact is on the actuarially determined contribution. And so this session is really to try and um, go through how we develop those contributions and specifically the amortizations so that the board has a uh, kind of a strong foundation to understand how the POB may affect things. Back in June, we talked about some alternative amortization methods, but here we really wanna just focus, uh, assuming we keep our current methods in place, uh, what's the lay of the land and how does that work? Now, the city, for its role related to contributions, they have to pay the actuarially determined contribution that the board sets. Uh, they have some decisions on timing and, and that sort of thing, but they have to pay that actuarially determined contribution. But they could also make supplemental contributions, and that's really where the POB discussion uh, comes in because if they issue a POB, we would treat and deposit the funds with the retirement plan. We would treat that as a supplemental contribution. So uh, as we go through this, uh, please raise your hand or interrupt if you have any questions uh, because this is intended to be um, educational in nature and we need that interaction to make sure that people are following what we're saying or that we are addressing questions you may have uh, about how all this works. With that, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Ann to get us started on uh, how we develop the, the amortizations. 
Um, so um, as Bill said before, we get into the real meat of this presentation. We're going to take a step back and revisit the concepts of actuarial funding or uh, actuarial funding 101, if you will, to reinforce your understanding so you can better digest this whole POB discussion uh, in for the next couple hours here. So, as you know, uh, the purpose of a pension plan is to pay benefits throughout retirements for every member of the system with pre-funded contributions that are invested to earn interest. And this graph that you're seeing here shows the projected benefit payments based on your current membership. Um, it includes uh, not just the retirees, but also active members when they're expected to retire it, uh, is projecting their benefit payments as well. Um, this is also based on San Jose Police and Fire's plan provisions and your actuarial assumptions, which estimate when members are going to retire, what their salary is going to be at retirement, uh, which goes into their projected benefits, and also how long will those benefits be paid or how long are members going to live. So you can see uh, in 2021, the uh, benefit payments are around $250 million. Um, those projected payments are expected to go up over time as more and more members retire. And also as current retirees uh, receive their cost of living adjustments. So after 20 to 25 years, those uh, projected payments plateau uh, around uh, 2046. And um, that's at a point where if you recall, the average age of your active membership is about 41 years old. So in 25 years, they're going to be about 66 on average. And so most of the active members have retired at this point. And also the retirees uh, current age is 67. So in 25 years, uh, the average age is around 92. So a fair amount of those retirees have passed at this point. And so then you start to see this decline in those benefit payments. Um, as, as more and more of those active members uh, are dying as well. So if you add up each year's of these projected benefit payments, the total amount is $25 billion. Turning to the next slide, um, because the plan is pre-funded, the total city's outlay is expected to be much less than that $25 billion. Again, this is just based on uh, your current membership. Um, so what is the amount needed to, in today's dollars to fund these benefits? In other words, what's the present value of these benefits? To calculate, the, to calculate this, you take each year's benefit payments and you discount them to today, to 2021. In layman's term, um, and you're discounting these at the expected rate of return. So in layman's term and for the concept here, if you have a hundred dollars in benefits that need to be paid in 10 years. You don't need $100 invested today. Uh, you only need about 53, uh, a little more than half of that in today's dollars if you're assuming to earn 6.625%. So what that $53 represents is that the darker purple or darker blue uh, area of the discounted benefit payments in the residual $47 in interest is represented by those purple bars, the light purple bars. So uh, let's put this into perspective for your actual plan. And if you're looking at 2031, about 10 years from now, you need, uh, there's going to be about $375 million in projected benefit payments in 2031. However, looking at today's value of that, if you discount it with the assumed rate of return and you're expecting to earn interest on money that you invest today, you only need about $200 uh, in today's, uh, in the bank today to, to get to that $375 million in 10 years. So in the near term, you can see that the discounted interest is a smaller portion of those total benefit payments. But as time goes on and in the long term, those interest discounts make up more and more of the total projected benefit payments. And that's really taking advantage of the theory of the compounding of interest. Um, I do wanna make a note before going on to the next slide, that this total projected benefit stream um, is not affected by 
the assumed rate of return or the discount rate that's set. Uh, what the expected rate of return does, it, it allocates the total projected benefit payments between the interest discount and the discounted uh, projected benefit payments. So if you were to reduce the rate of return or your assumed rate of return, those light purple bars would all decrease, yet the dark purple bars would increase. So increasing the value, uh, present value of those benefits. So by removing the interest discount portion of, of those projected benefit payments, we're left with the discounted projected benefit payment, which is the present value of future benefits. And this is the amount that is needed to invest today, assuming that all assumptions are met, not just the um, assumed rate of return, but also all the demographic assumptions as well. So those present value of future benefits for police and fire are around $5.6 billion. Uh, and that's what is needed to be invested today at the 6.625%. And it's obviously a lot less than the $25 billion if you just sum up all of those benefits over the next 80 years. So with actual funding, we split the present value of all future benefits into two different components. Uh, the first is benefits already earned or accrued, and that's called our actuarial liability. Future benefits for actives, uh, which is based on future service they're expected to earn from today's date to retirement is the present value of future normal cost. All of the retirees um, in inactive liability um, it falls under the actuarial liability and the active membership, uh, their projected benefits fall in both categories. For the accrued liability, let, let's say someone is expected to uh, have 30 years of service at retirement, but they have 20 years today. Uh, the benefit attributable to that 20 years of service falls into the actuarial liability whereas the future 10 years of service would fall into that present value of future normal costs. So the actual liability is also known as your funding target. And in a perfect world, the accumulated assets would equal that funding, funding target. And assets and liabilities are expected to grow as, uh, at, you know, at the same rate so that you would have the actual liability equal to your funding target. And then future contributions would only need to be made to cover the benefits that are occurring for the current active members, which is, you know, is the normal cost. So, however, you know, we don't live in a perfect world. Um, assumptions have not always been met and assumptions have changed over the course of the last decade or two, which created an unfunded accrued liability where the assets are less than the actual liability. And the sum of these two uh, components here, the actual value of assets and the unfunded accrued liability is the accrued liability. So if the assets contract or they don't earn uh, the expected rate of return, you're going to see an increase in that unfunded liability. And similarly, if um, assumptions change, for instance, if people are expected to live longer, which would extend that stream of projected benefit payments, or we don't think that assets are going to assume as much, so we have to decrease the discount rate, which actually uh, shrinks that interest discount both of which would increase the accrued liability and therefore increase the unfunded accrued liability. So with that, um, the next logical question is how should the unfunded accrued liability ultimately get paid back so that you can reach the funding target of your plan? Hey, is this a good time to interrupt for a question? Perfect. Yes. Yes. Um, I just had a somewhat basic question on your projected benefit payments. Uh, sure. Does that assume that the active membership increases or it's static as of today? It's static as of the valuation date. So every valuation, we do this projection with the current membership. 
So it is, it does get updated at that snapshot time and uh, when we do the evaluation. Cool, okay. And then um, the second question is on the $25 billion number you threw, just to make sure I understand. It's, it's just a simple summation? Yes. It's not a, yep. okay. And if you discount it, it's five and a half billion. Is that? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And then one other clarifying question I had, which was, um, yeah, this allocation between principal and interest, I've always sort of had a little bit of trouble with, uh, with that. Um, can you just help me understand that a little better with the five and a half billion and the 25 billion number? Sure. It's not, it's not I, I, instead of thinking it of this principal and interest, it's more of um, how, you know, how much money, let's go to 2021, where you have $250 million in benefit payments, right? So if you had at the very beginning of 2021, you know you have to make $250 million in benefit payments. Let's say those were all made at the very end of the year. And you are going to assume that you're going to invest your money and you're going to have interest earnings on that. How much do you need to invest at the beginning of the year to be able to make those payments at the end of the year of $250 million? Well, it's one year's worth of interest, right? So you basically discount the $250 million with, by 6.625%. So it's a simple division of 1.06625, and you need about $240 million invested at the very beginning of the year to be able to pay the $250 million in assets. So you, or I'm sorry, $250 million in benefit payments. So we do that with each year of those projected benefit payments. And so when you get out to, let's say, 200 and 2050, most of those benefit payments are assumed to be paid from interest that's earned on the assets that are invested today, which those assets invested today would only need to be about 75 million today. And then each year you're assuming it's going to earn that 75 million, 6.625% for the next 30 years. So that 30 years worth of interest is what that interest discount is representing the purple uh, bar, the light purple bars. And the, the yeah. dark purple is the amount that needs to be invested today for those years of, for that year of benefit payments. Very helpful, thank you. So it, instead of calling it the discount for interest like we have here, it, it might be better to think about it as <clears throat> the discount for expected future investment returns. Right. Uh, because there's not like a <clears throat> bank crediting you interest. It's those future investment returns that are causing the discount. Yeah, I mean, I think it's the way I think about it, and correct me if I'm wrong, is um, it's almost the, the amount of assets you need to have to gen that would generate a 6.625% compounded interest over time to meet your full liability. Right. Is that yes. the way yeah. you think about it? Yes. Right. Yes. Uh, assuming that you're getting those investment returns each yes, and every year. Course. Yeah. I'm good, thank you. Okay, so um, I, I guess one other thing just to clarify, uh, we do this calculation for contributions based on the smooth actuarial value of assets uh, as opposed to the market value. And that's done to smooth out the contributions. Uh, but over time, we expect them to, to move together. Uh, and so we'll come back to those current impacts when we get uh, further along in this. I'm sorry, you, you lost me there. I thought the, um, the contributions were assumed in the first slide. You mean the extra contributions from the city? I thought that was what we were solving for. We are solving for it, but it's based on the unfunded actuarial liability that we're going to uh, set those contributions uh, to meet is based on the actuarial value of assets and not the market value of assets. Oh, okay, yeah, makes sense, yeah. And so once we've defined that unfunded actuarial liability, then um, the question is, 
uh, how do we get the plan back to the funding target so that the assets equal the funding target? And, and we could just say, you know, if, if we weren't concerned about the city at all, we could just say, well, we're $1.2 billion short. Uh, city, we need $1.2 billion this year. Um, but that's a pretty hefty burden on the city's budget. And if we did that every year, it may not be uh, quite that large, but it would be very volatile. Uh, and so what we do is we establish uh, a plan and mechanism uh, to return the plan to that full funding target within a reasonably short period of time. If we do it too short, it makes the city's budget budgeted contributions too volatile. If we do it too long, uh, we can fall too far behind in funding before we catch up. And so generally, um, we've found that 15 to 20 years is a reasonable balance, but that's always adjustable by the boards between that stability and getting us back to the full funding within a reasonably short period of time. So if we decided that we wanted to just uh, pay this off over 15 years, we could set up a, a schedule of amortization payments that are just a level dollar amount over 15 years, just like a loan uh, that would get the fund back to uh, its full funding target in 15 years uh, if all of our assumptions are met. Now that schedule would have uh, sort of principal payments and interest payments. The principal payments would be the actual amount we'd expect the UAL to go down each year. And the interest is really just the expected return that the plan didn't get because it wasn't fully funded. So you're, uh, as you build, uh, as you pay down that UAL, then the interest payments get smaller. So it, it acts like a loan, except those interest payments aren't really interest, they're just the, re the expected return uh, that the plan is not getting. And, and we account for the difference between the actual and the expected return somewhere else. Now that, that makes for a very simple, straightforward set of payments uh, as a level dollar amount. But uh, that's not how we normally do it on an ongoing basis. Uh, so on an ongoing basis, there are a couple differences. First, instead of a level amount, we usually design these payments as slightly increasing amounts. Uh, and for this plan, we use two and a half percent increases. And that's so that the payments are tied essentially to inflation, so that they're the same real dollar payments. The idea being that payroll and the city's revenues are gonna grow over time. And so um, these kinds of payments would create a similar burden on the city over the entire period of 15 years. Then the other issue we have is that the unfunded liability measure changes every year. And so we have to uh, be able to adjust it every year. It's not that we can just set it once and, and have a payment stream and be done with it. And, and so the next year, we may not have good investment returns or, or we may have a whole bunch of retirements and we have what we call an experience loss. And so we add on another 15 year amortization uh, to that set of schedules. And then the following year, maybe we do have uh, an investment gain or a other gain. And then we set up an amortization credit. So it, it's like a negative payment for that gain. And the idea is the present value of all of these payments adds up to the current UAL. But you can have positive and negative payments. And then the board may decide they want to lower the discount rate or make another assumption change. And so we add in a schedule 
of payments for that assumption change. Now we do assumption changes over 20 years so that it takes a longer period and doesn't disrupt the funding as much. Uh, and we do experience gains and losses over 15 years. So that's why these purple bars extend out further. But if you keep going with this and every year you're adding some uh, experience gain or loss and periodic assumption changes, you get to something like what we have today. And so this is uh, sort of the, the amortization schedule we have right now, uh, expected for 2021. Uh, the gold bars are experience gains or losses. So the ones above zero are losses. The ones down here are gains. The purple bars are assumption changes that we've made. Uh, green is uh, benefit changes. There are a few of those. Uh, and this teal line represents the, the net payments. Now down here, the, the bright gold is our investment gain for 2021 that we're expecting to put in. This is an estimate. And so it comes in as, as a credit. Now, remember, we're smoothing those investment gains over five years. This is just the first installment of it. But when we put that installment in, you can see it, it uh, brings this uh, net payment down. Our lowest payment is about five and a half million. But if we roll forward, we've got a bunch of gains built up that we haven't recognized yet. And when we give you our projections, assuming six and five eighths percent returns each year, we start adding in those gains in, in the future. And so you add in a credit in 2022, another credit gets added in in 2023, another one in 2024, and another one in 2025. So all of these dark gold bars are the results of this last year's investment returns and, and what that impact is. Each of those uh, over the next five years comes in with a 15 year uh, amortization credit period. So that changes the net payment uh, and reduces it as we go forward. We get down here, uh, the lowest net payment is almost negative 60 million. Uh, but there's another provision to the plan that we need to keep in mind which is that the, the minimum contribution is equal to the normal cost, which means we can only use net negative credits uh, to cover administrative expenses. And so this red line is um, the most we can take in a credit. And so, all of these credits uh, do not actually affect the contribution because we hit this minimum uh, here in 2034. We're projected to hit it. Does that make sense to everyone? Mm, not fully, I'm sorry. I, I understood the, the red part, but I, I'm not sure. I, uh understood the lowest net payment. Uh, it, this is just the, it, if we were looking, so the net payments are just the sum of all these bars in any given year. That's the net payment that the city would have to make for tier one. And the lowest one oh, comes okay. right here at negative 59 million. Uh, but that's lower than the red line, so we don't actually get to do that. It's just that would be the scheduled payment. Got it. Now, of course, this all assumes that we get six and five eighths percent returns. So uh, these other bars are not guaranteed. They will change with our actual investment returns. So we'll have to um, look at that as it emerges. Um, but if we did get our assumed return, um, that's what we'd be looking at. 
So now we wanted to look at what happens to this if we add a POB into the mix. And so at the first level, this is where we're starting. This is the same as the prior chart, uh, just to, to get us set. And we're going to look at a $250 million POB uh, that uh, is spread over 15 years. So um, that's both the city's payments and our amortization credits. We'll start by putting in, if we receive $250 million up front, that's going to reduce our unfunded liability by $250 million. And so now we need this amortization schedule adjusted so that the present value uh, still falls, um, it still adds up. And under our current policies, we'd set up this 15 year amortization credit. Harvey, you have your hand up. Did you want to ask? Yeah, something? yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, sorry to interrupt, but I noticed at the top title of this slide, Bill, you call it the tier one amortization schedule. Could you explain that? Because we, we don't segregate assets between tier one and tier two. Right. Uh, so here we are looking at the, the tier one amortization schedule. Tier two, the, uh, the pieces get split 50-50. Um, and tier two is very close to full funding already. So my understanding was that if the city does a POV, they wanted to direct it to pay off the tier one UAL. So even though the assets aren't uh, separated, we're looking at the impact on the tier one amortization schedule if there's a POV. And to clarify, the when Bill said 50-50, he means 50% uh, goes to the uh, city's UAL payment and the members actually pay 50% of that as well. Um, okay, uh, I don't wanna get hung on water right now. If tier two had um, an unfunded liability, POB money coming in could not be directed towards tier one's uh, amortization. Well, I think that would be a board decision about whether that. Uh, well, that's what I'm, yeah, that, that's what I'm how, saying. It, it's, yes. it's not, it, it wouldn't be up to the city to dictate where it wants us to apply the, the dollars. Okay, I, I understand what your label is now. Uh, if, if I can jump in here, Mr. Chair, I think that specific question and discussion was the main reason um, I reached out to Bill about asking him to put together a presentation, which first of all, let me just say, it's a very good presentation, but I also recognize it is a very challenging concept. I know your board received uh, Chiron's annual evaluation presentation, and we talk about the amortization policies, but I don't think that, because that's just one of the many issues that are addressed during the evaluation discussions, we don't really spend enough time. But since the, this particular question or issues can have an impact on how the POB issuance is recognized and therefore have implications on future stream of payments. Um, I thought it was appropriate for your board to receive a more detailed presentation and also be clear or at least ask questions today so that uh, we can be ready at the joint meeting to address issues from both the city staff and the um, and the city council. Because if I was city staff or I was a council, I certainly, uh, one of the many questions that I would ask uh, for me to decide on the potential implications of the POB issuance is how would it be recognized? And since uh, dealing with the amortization policy or schedule uh, has a direct impact on how, how those uh, funds will be recognized, I just felt that this 
uh, presentation was not only necessary, but very timely. So I appreciate, uh, obviously, Chiron. I, I know it's, it's, it is challenging, but I think it's important that we at least try to understand the basic concepts so that when we get direct questions, if we do, which I fully expect them to be, at the joint meeting, we are ready to address it. Thank you. Okay. So, so if we got 250 million in, we would set up right now a 15 year amortization credit for that 250 million because it would reduce our unfunded liability by 250 million. And that reduces the contribution the city has to make uh, by the amount of that amortization credit. Uh, until we hit that minimum amount. And so then, uh, then those amortization credits can't be used. They end up uh, just helping us build and maintain a surplus. Uh, and the actual city contribution would be based on this red line. So there's really, out after uh, 2034, there's no difference in the city's contribution, whether they give us a POB or don't, if we earn six and five eights uh, for the, the foreseeable future. Obviously, these move around if our returns are different. But based on our projections uh, at six and five eights, uh, there would be no difference starting in 2034. There'd be a slight difference in 2033. And 2032, you'd still have a, a reduction in the city's payment to in the city's contribution to the pension. Now, when from the city's perspective, though, they also have to pay the debt service. Uh, and so here, they have some flexibility in how they structure that debt service. For this illustration, I did it over 15 years, assumed a 3% interest rate, and assumed that they structured the payments the same way we structure the amortization, which they may uh, not. We'll have to find out how they want to structure that. But if you just put that in here, then this light green would be their debt service. And that would move the net line up. So that this is their net payments combining the contribution to the pension plan with their debt service. Um, but you notice it, it's still lower than what it was without the POB. And that's because of the difference between the interest they're paying on the POB and the expected return that we're using in, in the pension plan. But starting in 2032 and 2033, they still have the same minimum payment to the pension plan, and that won't offset their payments, their debt service. So their net contribution after the uh, debt service would actually be higher uh, with a POB than without. Now, again, that's assuming uh, we get six and five eighths percent returns. And that's because the plan is projected to become fully funded and hit that minimum contribution um, because of our, our uh, schedule. Any question? Yeah. Um, on the previous slide, you said 27 by 27. You said we would set up a 15 year amortization credit. Is that a, basically to be consistent with our 15 year amortization assumption for the unfunded liability, or is this just an additional assumption we're making? This is uh, based on our current policy, which just says any sort of experience gain, and we include in that supplemental contributions, we amortize over 15 years. But what we suggested 
in our June presentation was if we actually get OPOB, the board may want to consider alternatives to that. But this is under our current current policy and how it would work. Okay. And then the other question I had was the next slide is the, the debt cost for the city. Is that just an illustration to look at the total cost or is does the, I'm assuming the plan doesn't bear the cost of the no, the plan does not bear the cost. That's all from the city. And yes, what I was saying is the city has uh, a variety of ways they can structure it. To illustrate here, I assumed they did 15 years with payments increasing 2.5% per year and that their borrowing cost was 3% interest. Now, their borrowing cost is going to be set by the market. Their payment schedule is based on how they set up and structure the bond. So it's not necessarily exactly like this, uh, but this is an illustration of the, the type of thing. And, and my next slide is, what if they set it up the same way, but did it over 30 years? So, Before you go there, just to make sure I'm grounded. So basically, if you look at the, the dark, is that dark green? and the light yes. green, the sum of that of those two is the cash outflow for the city? Yeah, uh, this, so these are uh, credits set up based on six and five eighths percent interest. Oh no, and I mean the lines, payments. I mean the debt service line. Oh, the debt service line, mm -hmm. this green line, mm -hmm. that's the total of the, payments and credits in each year, including the POV debt service. So that, that would be the total amount the city would be contributing to the plan for the UAL, plus the amount they pay in debt service on the POV. Okay. Although they would have made the POB, whatever they funded, 250 million would have been paid in 2022 to the plan. Yeah, we're assuming it comes in July 1, 2022. Okay. All right, I think I get it. And, and so then the other piece is if they stretched it out over 30 years, the debt service payments are smaller, but go on for a longer time. And so that means in the early years, there's a bigger reduction in their total payments. You recall on the prior slide, they were pretty close together. Um, but then they have this, uh, this long period starting uh, in 2033, when their payments are higher than they would have been without the POV. And that goes from 2033 all the way out till they pay off the POV. But again, that's just on the baseline um, scenario where we get six and five eighths percent return each and every year for the next 30 years. So I, yeah, I wanted to go ahead, Roberta. No, I was just going to say I was just going to be consistent with my comments from prior board meetings, and I know this one I have shared with you, Bill. Is I know you have made some assumptions as you have explained or some of these numbers, but I think the biggest one that I don't, I just don't want the trustees to forget, and and the public in general. There's the big assumption that we are meeting all the assumptions, including the investment rate of return, which no, which we know is not going to happen. So that have a huge implication, a huge that could have a huge impact, especially on the expected rate of return, on the timing of those returns, that will have a huge impact as well. So I, I recognize for presentation purposes, there's not much you can do about it. You have to assume, but um, you know, I just want everyone to understand that because. Um, that, that, that will have an impact on everything that, you know, all the numbers that, that we're looking at. 
Yeah, so I, I wanted to show some of those scenarios. Are you now seeing the, the interactive model? We got it, Bill. Okay, so, um, you know, th these are the revised projections we've been showing with a 26.49% return for last year. And the red line was our 2020 valuation projection. And the gold bars show what we're um, estimating the projection will be based on the 2021 valuation. And it's, it's much lower. But that does assume six and five eighths each and every year. So we could have, uh, there are a couple issues to, to look at here, uh, especially for the city as they're considering a POV. Uh, you know, obviously they'd like us to get good returns, but if we got good return, if we had another year of good returns, uh, 15% returns would bump us up to 95% funded on a market value basis by 2022. If we got another 20%, we'd be 100% funded. Now at 100%, we've talked about it in, in other things, that, that changes some of our strategies and approaches and, and opens up a whole different conversation. Uh, on the flip side, and if we're 100% funded, not sure that the city would really want to contribute uh, a POB at that point to the plan. But on the other side, as Roberto's pointing out, we, and we could easily have um, some sort of retraction in the market. And so if I put in like three straight years of 0% returns, that drops us ultimately back down to 76% funded. Uh, and we, the contributions still go down for a little while because we do have those unrecognized gains built up that would offset some of the losses. But ultimately, they go back to about where we were and what we had scheduled before. So, um, you know, the, the city's got their municipal advisor who's going to be doing analyses on different scenarios to decide whether, um, you know, a POB is worth it. And they're going to have uh, a balance between, you know, they, they're certainly looking at the, the costs of a down scenario. Um, the other thing that comes out with this is even if we get good investment returns, um, we're going to hit full funding without a POB. So it takes away some of their uh, potential upside on the POB uh, in their analysis. So um, I don't know exactly what scenarios they're looking at or, or how they're deriving them, but uh, you know, obviously different return scenarios are going to have very different results. Uh, with or without a POV. So I don't know, Roberto, did that get to the illustrations you're concerned about? Absolutely. About? You know, you and I have spoken about this. This is a tool that I have mentioned that we should bring to the joint meeting. And, and Bill was nice enough to just show zero returns. Um, and, you know, when we had this conversation, he actually showed me negative returns, which are, you know, obviously more challenging. So I, I just, because there's so much conversations and all these numbers kind of flow together and people, you know, just look at getting close to 100% because that's what we're using as a, as a uh, presentation. I just want to make sure that everyone understand that, that the opposite uh, is also as likely and, you know, it just is going to take us the other way around. So I think it's important that everyone, but especially those that will be considering moving forward, what to do with the POB, they can see uh, uh, positive uh, experiences uh, moving forward, um, also meeting the assumptions, but also negative, meaning the lower than expected. And that, you know, will give everyone a full picture of what they 
potential implications are and the total range. So thank you, Bill. I think it's very helpful. I just wanted to let you know uh, the time certain for the city is 11.30. I don't think there's anything wrong if we go past, you know, five, 10 minutes, but I just want you to know that so because I'm not really sure how much more you have from the presentation. Thank you. I don't have much more. I did want to um, also raise the issue of the discount rate um, because if we change the, the discount rate, uh, that changes the picture some. Uh, now, the way this model set up, it changes the discount rate back to 2020. I don't have it set up to just change it for 2021. Uh, but it obviously uh, raises the funding target and that reduces the, the funded percentage and increases the, the city's contribution amounts. So we will be um, starting our normal discussion of the discount rate next month uh, and starting to go through that process. Um, but that's the other variable that comes in here uh, and could uh, affect the analysis. So with that, we would just take any other questions people may have. Thanks, Bill. Hey, let's do it this way. I'm going to go round robin through the trustees, and then I'll call on Roberto uh, Prabhu and then Harvey, and then I'll open it up. I noticed we got a lot of uh, guests from the city, and we'll open the floor up. You folks are welcome to ask any questions you want. So let me start. Andrew, any questions or comments for Bill? Uh, no questions. Uh, just comment was just excellent job. The uh, numbers uh, do uh, paint a, a story for us, um, and help and it helps a lot. Thank you. Uh, Sunita, you did a great job jumping in the middle, Sunita. I think that was great. That helped actually hide one or two of those questions myself. Any more questions, Sunita? I'm good for now. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, feel free to jump in if something comes to mind as we go through. Ashfar, any questions? I uh, know. Good presentation, uh, and I think it uh, you know makes things quite clear. Thank you. Great. Um, Dick, any questions for oh, Bill good, and good Anne? presentation and the colleagues' questions are very helpful. Thank you. Great. Um, Franco? No, no questions. Thank you, Bill. That's great. I see your hand up, Pam. I'll go to you right after we get to uh, Harvey. Thanks. Dave, any questions? No, and thank you for the presentation. Thanks. Um, my only comment would be, boy, Bill, that was just great. We, we always jokingly say that the way, right way to think about this is I'm in a big train room in the middle of a big train yard, and there's 100 knobs on the wall. And, and those, a lot of those knobs are Bill's little built up vertical bars. And each of those knobs has a high degree of uncertainty. And I think it really did a good job um, of showing that. Um, Roberto, I think it was great that you jumped in um, too. And, and any further questions or comments, Roberto? Uh, no, no, thank you, Drew. Again, I appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Bill. Uh, excellent presentation. And I know that this job uh, that you did, because of the chance of giving you to expand your current knowledge, you are giving us a discount. But you don't have to thank us for it. You know, we just we are we are always willing to give you uh, accurate challenges to expand your horizon. So you don't even have to mention it. Hey, the next beer is on me, Bill and Ann. <laughs> um, any comments, Prabhu, or questions? Excellent stuff, Bill. Thank you. No, no, no questions. Harvey, you, you did a good job jumping in too, Harvey, clarifying stuff. Any questions or comments from you, Harvey? No, I'm all good for right now. Thanks. Great. Go jump in, Pam, and then I'll open the floor up. Great. No questions. I just wanted to echo everybody's uh, sentiments. Really great presentation, Bill. It helped me understand from the trustee's point of view what you'll be looking at. Thank you. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. That's great. I, I see you're out there, Julie, a bunch of other city folks. Feel free to jump in if you have any questions uh, for Bill before we start your presentation. No, I, I, don't, I don't have any specific questions, but I think I think just to draw a distinction that, you know, the city council is looking at the funding level, both the federated and the police and fire retirement plan. And fortunately, your funding level is much better than the federated plan. So as we move through this evaluation process and conversation with the council, it will be in the context of looking at the two plans dis as distinct decision making processes, not as a holistic decision making process since the funding levels are so different. So, so 
as you can yeah, see. I, I, I would note that the analysis I've showed you for the police and fire plan would look very different for Federate. So, um, but you're the police and fire board, so I wanted you to see what's going on with your plan. Thanks. Anybody else from the city want to jump in? Um, if not, since we're time certain at 1130, why don't we take a five minute break and five minutes from now will be time certain and the city can give their presentation. So five minutes, folks.
city who are on this call. I'm not sure all the trustees know um, sure. everybody is. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, what I'll do is I'll introduce a couple of the staff members from the city. Uh, please know that the city made a similar presentation uh, as you're going to receive this morning to the federal board last month. Of course, this one is geared towards your plan, but it's a similar presentation in concept. Um, I'll let the city make the detailed presentations about uh, who's involved, including the consultants that are working with them. But from the city standpoint, I think the lead person in the presentation is my counterpart, Director of Finance, Julia Cooper. And along with her, we also have Jim Shannon, the Director of uh, Budget. And you all know Sherry Parkman, you can see her there, she's there as well. And I also know uh, uh, that Nicholas, uh, Nikolai is uh, also uh, a uh, staff on the senior staff for uh, Julia's uh, finance office is also part of the city presentation. And along with them are a number of other players, including consultants. So uh, I'll just let uh, Julia introduce them. And with that said, Mr. Chair, uh, unless you have any uh, questions or comments, I'll turn it over to Julia for uh, the representation. No, just uh, welcome back, Julie. It's always a pleasure to see you and your fine staff. Over to you, Julia. Okay, th thank you. So um, we'll, we'll, we've got the slide deck up and you had it in your um, board materials as well. So um, if you go to slide two, um, we have the list as um, uh, Roberto pointed out, you know, in terms of the city team, I have myself and then Jim, Nikolai and Cheryl are here. And then um, our municipal advisor is Urban Futures Inc. And they'll be making part of the presentation. We have Michael, uh, Julio and Wingsy will be making part of that, that presentation. So they're on, this is Zoom, multiple page boxes of, of, uh, of folks. So in terms of the next slide, kind of our agenda, we're going to talk about the challenge, kind of the, the UAL, which as I noted a little earlier, isn't quite as isn't quite as big as it is for your counterpart plan over on the federated side, but all in all, we wanna talk about it in general, kind of the city goals and policy considerations. And wanna point out, these are things that are happening at the staff level. The city council has not adopted any policy at this point. We've just been in an education process with them as well. Then um, UFI is gonna talk about kind of POBs, what we like to affectionately call 2.0, you know, in the early part of doing the, you know, you know, 10, 20 years ago, the whole structure for pension obligation bonds looked a lot different than they are today. A lot of those changes coming out of accounting regulations and things like that and how we look at that. Evaluating kind of the outcome of the POBs that UFI will continue to talk about that. And then I'll make some final kind of considerations and open it up for, for questions. So on the next slide, just looking at kind of, you know, um, you know, the mayor's budget message back in 2009 directed the formation of that stakeholders group, which Drew, I believe you were a part of. And um, those meetings commenced in November of 2019, and they issued their final report in April of 2021, which resulted kind of in that, stu that long study session we had with the city council um, back in April. So really kind of we've evaluated a whole host of funding options with extensive kind of risk and scenario analysis, really with the goal of improving both the funding level of the two retirement plans and creating a meaningful reduction in the city's UAL payments, because that, in that way we can help kind of create a little bit of budgetary relief. We believe that the POBs are really the last tool in the toolbox with all the pension reform work and the things like that we've done. We really think while we started looking at this pension obligation bonds way back in, I think 2007 is the earliest memory I have of, of the city looking at it. We really think we've taken all the tools we have and we're kind of at the end of what we really can do to make a meaningful re reduction in the UAL. So in terms of being able to put that tool in the toolbox, as you can see on the next slide, we have to go through a judicial validation process in order to be able to issue the POBs. And this is just a list of all those steps that are involved in that judicial validation. The council, uh, we've agendized for the 21st of September council meeting, um, council action to commence that process. Mm -hmm. That process can take anywhere from four to seven months without an answering of a complaint or an appeal. 
So assuming everything goes completely smoothly and nobody answers the complaint or there's an appeal process, we expect that to be four to seven months in duration. So the best case scenario is that we would need to be able to into the market with POBs into, until calendar year 2022. If in fact somebody answers and there's an appeal process, all bets are off on how long that could take. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Cheryl to talk a little bit about the unfunded liabilities and the challenges. Thank you, Julia. So, you know, I believe that the police and fire board knows very well what the unfunded status is of their plan. This is an incredibly engaged board and you know that while this is in the billions of dollars and you're 74% funded, that the city and the retirement boards have a shared concern that we want to make sure that there's enough money in these systems for now and for the future. And what we've seen in this past year and what we've seen from, from Bill Hallmark's projections is that the UAL unfunded status is actually, um, or the funded status is actually increasing to 77%. And this is on a, a great trajectory. However, our goal or your board's goal is to make sure that there's enough money. And so our challenge is always increasing that funding status to make sure that there will be enough. And if we go to our next slide, we can see what our, our other challenge here with, with the city is that we have seen increasing city contributions to the retirement plans in the hundreds of millions for, you know, for several years. And while we've gotten great returns this past year, and it appears that these contributions are decreasing, we know that that requires all of our assumptions to be 100% met each and every year in order for these contributions to stay on this downward trajectory. So our challenge is always to increase our funded status and to make sure that we as this as the city can provide these contributions to the retirement plan so that we have these we have these funds for people. So the challenge continues to exist. And as Julia said, we're looking at all of the tools in the toolbox we have for the last decade. We have for uh, many years in order to, to find what we can do. So while it does look like it's decreasing, that could change next year. It could change on a moment's notice. And so with that, I'm, I'm gonna send it back to Julia to talk a little bit about what this means in terms of, of the city's uh, credit ratings. Yeah, thank you, Cheryl. So um, as you know, the city has credit ratings. So um, our general credit rating is uh, one notch below the highest AAA rating. So we're a AA plus from all three rating agencies. But when they do their credit reports on the city, they obviously outline a number of positive considerations. We have strong reserves, economic strength, large diverse tax base. We have a strong you know, financial management team and a history of making really tough financial decisions when we have to with respect to keeping our budget in balance. However, big capital, however, there are credit concerns and all three rating agencies do look at pension and OPEB liabilities and see our high fixed costs and our leveraging. So they look at how those fixed costs are elevated compared to our peers. And any plan that's under 80% funded is really, they look at is warranting greater scrutiny in their um, credit rating process. So for us, it's really important that we kind of address this um, so that we can keep those high ratings because those high ratings mean lower borrowing costs for us when we're funding those capital improvement projects that are important to the organization. So um, then um, on the next slide, I just wanna start to kind of talk about a little bit about some of the city goals and um, before I turn it over to Nikolai. So I really think the goals are aligned between the city and the, and the boards about wanting to have retirement plans that have long-term sustainability to provide the benefits that we've promised to our current active employees and our retirees. So while we don't obviously control the investments, we're legally obligated to pay the liabilities to both systems. And so, you know, it's, you know, you send us a bill every year and we send you a check. Um, sometimes we send you that check and 26 times a year if we don't pre-fund, and then sometimes we send this one big lump sum payment. So we really want to reduce that current 
annual burden of the UAL on all city funds, but particularly the general fund. And police and fire is, you know, 100%, basically 100% general fund contributions, um, given that police and fire are general fund obligations. So we want to prevent those contributions from rising, as they're projected to do through 2029. And then we're also looking, if we were to issue POBs, to kind of accelerate the amortization of those unfunded um, liability, um, kind of recycling the savings. And one of the analogies I'd like to use is if you refinance the mortgage on your house and you have like a monthly savings when you're refinanced, you know, looking at, oh, can I continue, do I, instead of taking that savings and taking a trip, do I take those savings and pay down principal every month? And then I reduce the amount of period of time in which I have my house loan outstanding. So I think as the council, as we as staff bring forward policies for the council to consider, that may be one of the things that we want them to consider is how to use those annual budgetary savings to then further kind of generate um, and accelerate those uh, UAL savings to the to the organization. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Nikolai. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chairman Lanza and board members, Nikolai Sklarov, Deputy Director of Finance, uh, overseeing the Debt and Treasury uh, Management Division. Um, whether the city issues POBs or not, as a matter of best practice, the city plans to develop updated pension funding policies that modify existing policies and adopt new ones. The city already has a robust debt policy and policies on the use of one-time funds that have been adopted by the city council. And these address how we refinance our debt, how we structure the term of our bonds, how we evaluate any savings from refinancings. But just as we have those debt policies for our bonds, these pension funding policies would address the city's largest long-term obligations, our obligations to our pension systems. And as part of that, we expect the policies will also address how POBs would be structured if and when council authorizes POBs. Credit rating agencies, uh, as Julia just mentioned, uh, who evaluate the city um, consider whether we have those sorts of pension funding policies, both when they rate the POBs, but also when they consider our other obligations, as Julia was just alluding to. And under the factors that could lead to an upgrade to the city's uh, ratings, Moody specifically cited uh, in July a material decrease in the city's unfunded pension and OPEP liabilities. And that's a consistent message from all three rating agencies. So the city shares a very strong interest in the funding status of the plans. Some of the key points we would expect to address before any POBs are issued include how would savings be used? How much of the savings might be recycled to accelerate the funding of the pension liabilities? How would the term of the refinancing compare to the term of the liability that's being refinanced? And our municipal advisors will be discussing that shortly. And we would expect that these policies would highlight that POBs would only be used for refinancing, not to defer amortization. To the contrary, this whole effort uh, at the city is motivated by a desire to accelerate and improve the funding status of our plans. The city, as you know, has been working to address unfunded pension liabilities for going on 15 years. And as Julia has discussed, uh, considered and rejected uh, many more uh, uh, approaches. Um, and we're now down to the, the last tool in the toolbox, the one that can make an appreciable change in a multi-billion dollar UAL across two pension plans. And while it is true that other cities across the countries have used POBs to specifically produce budget relief or to defer payments, that's not the intention here. The city has earned its high credit ratings from all three rating uh, agencies through prudent stewardship of its debt financings through the years. And we expect the pension funding policies adopted by council to reflect the same prudent and fiscally conservative approach. The boards and council have different duties and responsibilities, but they're both aligned, uh, wholly aligned in wanting a healthy funding status uh, for each retirement plan. Because no matter what the council ultimately decides to do with POBs, it will still be the one funding the liabilities with or without POBs. Because the boards and council each have different duties and responsibilities, the benefits and risks of POBs are different for the board and for the council. 
only the city council will authorize and issue the bonds and only the council will be responsible for paying those bonds. Conversely, only the board will make the investment decision. But from a board perspective, the POBs will provide a large infusion of cash, either all at once or over time if the city chooses to issue bonds in multiple tranches. But imagine what, what this board could have done with another 250 million or 500 million of investable cash over this past year. POB financing will also increase the funding ratio of each plan. And by replacing the city's IOU with cash, the plans will have less reliance on annual contributions from the city. As we discussed at length with our city council in our nearly four hour study session in April, all financings introduce different elements of risk. And this is certainly true of POBs. And we covered those at length in April. But it's important to emphasize that most of those risks are borne by the city, not this board. The city would borrow the funds, but the board would invest the funds. If the board can't invest the funds or doesn't earn an average rate over the life of the bonds that exceeds the rate of the bonds, the city certainly will be worse off. It will pay more because the city's obligation to fund the plan is never extinguished. But as you'll hear shortly, we're in a really unique market environment where interest rates are incredibly low. Cities are borrowing POBs for well below 3% this summer. So the barrier to success is particularly low now. And we will lock in that low borrowing rate on the bonds for the life of the bonds when the bonds are sold. Now, ultimately, the city strategy only succeeds if this board is successful in investing the funds that the city advances. And while the city has its role and the board has its role, uh, we're all ultimately only uh, successful if there's coordination. And that's why we have our uh, study session on the 30th. And with that, I'd like to introduce our city's municipal advisors, Urban Futures, Inc. They were uh, retained uh, earlier this year to help us evaluate various pension funding strategies, including POBs. So let me turn this over to our advisors at UFI who will discuss further about POBs. Thanks, Nikolai. My name is Wing C. Fox, uh, Urban Futures. Let me turn to the next slide. So when we're evaluating the economics of issuing pension obligation bonds to improve the funding status of the retirement plans, we're looking at both the savings achieved by replacing the UAL payments effectively amortized at the 6.625% currently um, interest rate with POBs at a significantly lower interest rate. We also do look at the investment return achieved by the plan that now has more assets to invest as a result of the POB proceeds. Um, my, my colleague Julio will address in further slides. But from the savings aspect, we're essentially looking to refinance the UAL not unlike refinancing a 6.625% fixed rate mortgage at a lower interest rate. Or if we don't refinance the entire mortgage, we're essentially looking to get a loan at say 3% or lower in order to prepay a portion of the outstanding principal of the mortgage. Next slide, please. As Nikolai mentioned, due to favorable market conditions, there's been a significant uptick in the issuance of POBs um, this last year and in the last five years a majority of which are California issuances. Uh, these are largely strong credits utilizing POBs as a tool that is part of a comprehensive and proactive approach to addressing pension liabilities and not as a Hail Mary to plug uh, budget gaps. Uh, just by way of reference, Buena Park, a AA plus credit recently sold POBs with a final maturity of 2043. So about 22 years at a true interest cost of 2.36%. Next slide, please. As Julia mentioned uh, earlier, the POB market has really evolved substantially since their inception approximately three and a half decades ago. We like to call it POBs 2.0. So GASB 68, for example, moved pension liabilities from the notes section of financial statements directly onto balance sheets, which created the carrying of a large liability on the books and compelled a lot of agencies to pay higher level of attention and analysis on pension liabilities. So cities with strong management like San Jose have been creating meaningful plans to address rising pension costs, including pension reform, developing and adopting pension obligation funding policy, evaluating multiple funding strategies, and performing extensive scenario and market and timing risk analysis to fully understand the risks of POBs before deciding to proceed. 
Well, in this slide, it just shows a comparison of POBs 1.0, or prior generation POBs with POBs 2.0. So whereas before, swaps and derivatives, capital appreciation bonds um, were somewhat popular, now all the issuances that you saw on the prior slide, they're plain vanilla fixed rate bonds, generally level debt service um, with 10-year par calls instead of make whole calls, which essentially are non-callable. And as the city is intending, most issuers are not extending repayment or, uh, of the finance or to finance normal costs with the pension obligation bonds. Um, and we're looking to match the term of the POBs with the amortization policy. So in this case, if uh, the police and fire plans were to keep uh, the current amortization policy and amortize a POB credit over 15 years, the POB would be issued at 15 years and not longer. The reinvestment risk um, that Nikolai mentioned earlier is still in existence. Um, and again, we will address that um, in a couple of slides. Uh, so just to describe a little bit about the structure, because um, I know there are you know, some questions about how the city might structure a pension obligation bond. Um, so where is, whereas in generations past, um, you would see the POB structured as escalating or deferred principal payments. Uh, now they are structured as level debt service payments and not unlike a mortgage, you're amortizing principal along the way. So, you know, whereas in the earlier years, you do pay more interest in principal, the principal amortization increases until the final maturity overall to achieve level debt service. And again, the term of the pension obligation bond would match the credit policy of the plan. With that, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Hugo. Thank you, Wingsy. Um, and I, I think that's really the key slide that we talk about is that there's been an evolution in the market and also the amortization policies are dramatically different. And I think that goes to the point that Julie was making and that Nikolai were making that we're not doing this for budgetary savings, but they are following sound financial management practices, trying to accelerate the payments and trying to reduce this liability because quite frankly, at six and five eights, it is the most expensive debt because that's the way we are treating it as a debt that the city has on its books. So it's important to kind of take a look at this because as we view it from a perspective of a debt portfolio, as, um, as Bill had put together a number of bases that you have and that there are adjustments every year, we looked at it from that perspective that there's UAL savings from these fixed dollar payments that you're required to make every year, right? Your normal costs are a variable percentage of payroll. And regardless if the city had no employees, they'd still have this past due payment for the UAL because those are benefits that have already been earned by the retirees and employees and you have them on a fixed dollar payment structure. So we look at that and we look at the cash flows which are actually much shorter and better savings for the case of the fire and, uh, police plans. But they had examined what would be the, the actual savings in that case and what makes it a little bit more uh, complex than traditional refinancing because it is taking a 6.625 and, and refinancing those payments uh, and changing it from escalating to fixed dollar, like a, a, a traditional mortgage. <clears throat> and then you then have to provide the money to you to invest. And as uh, Bill had noted, we understand that there are risks and primarily market timing risks. Ideally, you would do this over an, uh, a number of times. And, uh, but the problem that you have is if you invest the money all at once. So there, therein lies that primary risk, right? That, but that risk is not germane to a pension obligation bond. In fact, we always believed in one perspective that the board should be agnostic as to the source of money, whether the city had found the money in, in winning the lottery, issued a pension obligation bond or issued reserves, your decisions how to invest it, we believe it should be very similar, or at least the treatment in that case, because the city has those options. It has to fund your payments in some form or manner from its budget. So next slide. Okay, so what we did is we took the current amortization schedule issued and just for illustration took $500 million. This is just, and I know Bill used a different amount and equally so, it's just for illustration. We wanted to show what the impact would be in the UAL savings using your, um, your structure, your, your amortization, 15 year credit with rising annual increases. So you can see that it would lower its payments. 
Unfortunately, what the green bar also illustrates is that the greater savings due to your amortization policy happen towards the back end as it goes, it, the payments are declining. And ideally, if you'd want to have an impact in, on a net present value basis, you want to have that impact in the earlier years, right? Not towards the back end. So part of it is the structure that the city was always looking to is to not push the savings forward, but to accelerate the payments. So the way the amortization policy is now, the savings and the credit are deferred. And that's one thing that ends up being more costly over time. But that is what the UAL savings look like in this slide and the next slide is this suggestion of one of the things we had done, we've done this analysis and we do a number of refinancings and pension analysis for CalPERS agencies. And I know this is a different agency, but I wanted to have a little bit of a conversation of what other agencies are doing or other plans. And there are a number of them across the board, a number of counties, a number of agencies throughout the country use a very similar 15 year credit policy. But CalPERS, which we believe has been so much innovative in their approach towards uh, transparency in trying to encourage the, their agencies to prepay, actually require you to um, select a certain base. So we've used that base selection strategy, the notion that you could shape your cash flows, or as I mentioned in the prior slide, hopefully be able to select some of the shorter bases that even out the impact or more to uh, have that impact during the, 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 can we go back to the prior slide? Please. Right. So if you could select bases, you could actually have the savings pushed towards these years where the most significant budgetary impact would be. And, in, and one of the things Bill had also noted is at a certain point, if you extend out the credit too far, you end up with a credit that you essentially can't use. So part of it was the city was looking to effectively manage this and get the most bang for its buck when it's borrowing. Also, when you do a shorter borrowing, you also have a lower cost of borrowing. So it really was meeting two objectives, lowering its cost of borrowing and also having a maximum uh, budgetary impact. So that was the notion, next slide, of this base selection strategy that we've implemented for other agencies and the idea to have establish a conversation or to understand the motivation. It's the exact opposite of what was done in the past. People were extending payments, accelerating or having them continue to accrue in the back end in fact, the city's trying to do the exact opposite and accelerate the, the, the payments for reduce the total cost of borrowing. Uh, next slide, please. So the other part, and I think this is really critical and very different from what was done before, is that the city has spent a significant amount of time understanding the impact of market timing there. Is not contemplating doing a POB for the entire amount, much so, and Julie will say, it is a portion, these are illustrations, but we went through and did Monte Carlo analysis, scenario analysis, and did a number of case studies. And what we wanted people to understand is the earnings in the initial years is what really drives this. And what you're doing is leveraging your portfolio, like any other kind of additional leverage in the portfolio. You're making a larger investment, and for that investment to really take hold, you want to have a positive return. So we gave you two, we, from this Monte Carlo simulation, this is a, two different 11-year uh, outcomes with almost the same average return, right? 464 and 4, uh, uh, 644. But dramatically different ending portfolio values depending on what the returns won in those initial years. And we thought this was a good illustration and a thought that the city is keenly aware of this risk. So not only is it the amortization policy, but also what the returns will be for the investment profile of the board during those initial years. And that unfortunately is very difficult to control. Any hey, Julio, this, Julio, let me jump in this chair of lands. Let me make sure um, our analysis agree with yours. If We didn't do Monte Carlo analysis. We did real data going back to the Great Depression. And even though that's true, and you show, gosh, a huge differential here, there were no historical scenarios under which you lost money, right? None of your Monte Carlo simulations, gosh, we just had the worst first couple of years, but at the end of time, you know, real returns beat 3% interest, right? Yes, you, you would anticipate that in almost every case, Drew. We, when we ran them on a call, the, the success ratios are very high. Right. One of the things that people actually talk about is it, they used an oversimplified axiom that they said the, PO, the investment return has to simply beat the POB return. And what we try to do illustrate a little bit more complexity and say, 
it isn't, um, Chairman, just what the returns were, but people wanted to know whether it was a good deal. And we explained a lot of it depended on the returns in the initial years, just like you would say any kind of investment decision. If you, if you start out with a bang, you, you have a much greater likelihood of having a much higher portfolio value, all else being equal. Yeah, concretely, uh, just for the, the crowd, Julio, when we ran it every, I would use 30 years, you could guys say 15. We ran it every 30 year span going back to the year starting in 1928. And to make Julio's point, the real difference in real return, in actual returns over each of those three 30 year periods went anywhere from, well, it, it differed by a factor of five. You would have had five times more money in the best 30 year period than you would have had in the worst 30 year period. But all of them would have been better than 3% uh, debt. Thanks, Julio. Great presentation so far. Great. And by the way, this is so we end up having to optimize two variables that are very difficult at the end of the day. What your investment return is on one side, the debt, which we said is ideal, and that's the one thing the city can control. These are historically low interest rates. And it is very difficult to control the other side unless we have some dialogue of something that the board may have. So next slide. This comes to this last component. What can we do to mitigate that or to retain as much of the savings? One side, we talk about the idea that the absolute borrow, borrowing level is very low, so you have a, a big cushion. But we really only have two other options, Chairman. One is dollar cost averaging which I, I think I will save this board. I think everyone understands that notion, except for now when you're issuing debt, it becomes a bit more complex. Because for an investment side, you theoretically have the, the income that comes in and you make investments. $25 monthly investments to your child's 549 plan seems simple enough. But in the case of the city, it's a bit more complex because interest rates and the perspective is that they will continue to rise. So your cushion goes down. So that makes dollar cost average a little bit more difficult and hard to optimize. The other is a hedge, and hedges are extremely expensive. And we looked on the Bloomberg, you know, the prognosis is not very simple. The, all the other options, frankly, are too complex and ones that the city does not want to take on. It is one the investment committee could. You could decide to hedge these type things. Um, you know, you could do a structured note with a put or something to that effect. But they certainly, as a financial advisor, not something we would uh, recommend that the city take on to itself, but may fall within your purview to implement such a thing. Next slide. Thank, thank, thank you, Julio. So I just kind of wanted to, to kind of sum up as I started off um, the, with the presentation, you know, our interests and goals are aligned. In terms of the positive impacts for the city, we obviously want to reduce the UAL and improve our funding status and you know, help prevent those contributions from rising through fiscal year 29 as currently projected. And because it's the bill that we have to pay um, to, and we have a limited amount of resources, um, as that bill gets bigger, it crowds out the ability for the city to pay for other programs and services. Um, we also talked about you know, working with the council and looking at developing a policy where those annual budgetary savings could maybe be used to accelerate the amortization of the unfunded liability and then ease the, some of those current budget pressures at the same time. And then obviously the positive impacts from retirement plans is a large infusion of cash allows you the opportunity to make new investments either all at once or over time if the city decides to issue multiple series of bonds and thereby increasing the funding level for, you know, as we look holistically between the federated and the police and retirement plans. And then obviously reduce your reliance on the contributions from us relative to the funding status of the plan. So on the next slide, kind of just graphically kind of seeing the alignment of the roles with the city, it's our responsibility to divide the define and determine the funding strategy and our policies and always make that annual contribution. And then for, for the plan to look at how you would invest those proceeds and meet your benchmarks, what your asset allocation is and then set your investment policies. And at the end, hopefully those both come together to improve the funded status. So then just wanted to summarize up kind of where we are in, in this evaluation process is, Roberto mentioned, um, we made a similar presentation to the Federated Board a couple of weeks ago. Today, we're making the presentation to you. The council is scheduled to approve 
moving forward with the judicial validation action at their meeting on the 21st. And then both boards and the council will come together in a study session on September 30th. And as Roberto mentioned, um, he and I are working on the agenda for that study session and it will be distributed to, to everybody once it's been set. So, and then we will continue to work with the city council in development of the policies and continued analysis of various POB scenarios before we get to an ultimate um, recommendation for the council, which they can't move forward with actually issuing the POBs, as I mentioned, until we have a successful judicial validation. So with that, we're available to answer any questions. Well, thanks, uh, Julia and your staff and the folks from Urban Futures. Boy, that was great. I had a chance to um, look at the deck from, from Federated, and I thought it was great then. And this is really, really, really good, guys. So what you'll see in my bit um, after Harvey goes that that I think we'll respond um, to almost all the points you've raised, maybe not with answers, but certainly with, with steps to go forward. Um, let's go around um, the trustees, then let's do Roberto Prabhu and Harvey, and then we'll open the floor up again. Andrew, any any thoughts, any questions, comments? Uh, nothing at this time, but uh, thank you, Julian, and everybody from the city. Um, excellent presentation. Uh, Sunita, you want to weigh in with anything? Uh, yeah, I had a couple of clarifying questions, and yeah, I echo that. Great presentation. I attended the April one as well, which was, I thought was excellent. Um, I just... Um, can for my uh, sort of clarity purposes, what is the? Uh, I probably should know this, but what is the average cost of debt for the city outside of the pension, the six point six two five? What is what is the city issuing debt at today? Uh, I, a lot of it depends on how long the bonds are amortized for. Um, but we recently, I'm trying to think, Nikolai, what was the last? Oh, we did our geo bonds. We had thirty year geo bonds. And the all-in true interest cost on that, refresh my memory, was where we sub 3% on that. Those were basically tax, mostly tax-exempt bonds, some taxable, but um, I can't That's remember. That's good enough. I'm not looking but for it. I mean, it was significantly, it's very low borrowing cost for the city. And that would be our cheapest cost of borrowing would be our general obligation bonds because they are the highest rated. Sure. And then would the pension obligation would be sort of benchmarked on that typically in the market? On the geo one, Julie, I can take yeah, it. Go ahead. ahead, thanks, Wincy. Yes, yeah, so the the rating on bonds, as you know, drives a lot of the, the interest rates, and pension obligation bonds are issued at the same rating as the implied credit rating, so the same as the geo rating. Okay. Um, and and then one other related question: um, when you talk about amortization savings, are you talking about the difference between the six and uh, three eighths? And what you issued debt at, or are you talking about relative to your other cost of debt? If I if I might just interject here, I think what is unique about the amortization of the UAL is, which is very foreign to us who work in in bond financing, is that no matter what period you're amortizing that over, it's still the same rate, right? And, and in the municipal market, which is very different than the taxable market and how corporate corporations issue bonds, what we do is we serialize our debt so that if we are doing a 20 year bond, we couldn't in, in effect be selling 20 different uh, maturities, each with their own coupon. Um, the flat yield curve is a upward yield curve. Yes, exactly. Right. And and um, and as a result, uh, you know, while as an investor, uh, uh, people would be receiving their cash all at once. We would be making annual debt service payments each each year. Right, that add, makes sense. Yeah. Can I add and ask someone to bring back the presentation because I think this is really critical in understanding amortization and how they were done and what the difference in amortization policies and POBs are. There's that POBs 1.0 versus 2.0. And if I may, they're right there, that, that one, the blue with the light blue. Next slide. It was a graph, a chart, I'm sorry. I think it's one, there we go. So I think there's, there's two things. One, 
Nikolai was talking about rolling the fact that you have a different interest rate for each maturity. So it's not a 3% rate, but rather the first year it's 1%. Then the next year is 1.2, then 1.3, 1.4, 1.5. So you get a lower interest cost all in. That's a serialized structure. But the other part, as Nikolai was really saying, is that we make this look like an amortized mortgage or a car payment, the level annual debt services. And what you see is it's a far more cost-effective structure. So the amortization of the city's liabilities via the plan due to that increasing amortization every year pushes the debt outward. And what the POBs do, at least now the way they're practiced, they were practiced in the dark blue. Now everyone is doing that 2OBs 2.0 with the level annual payments. Obviously you're paying more principal earlier and it ends up being a more cost-effective structure. Yeah, no, I, I understood what he said. I'm a bond person, so I, I got it. But um, I think the, the question, the spirit of my question came from, I think, um, the, the comment that the amortization savings will be used for other benefits to the city. And I just was trying to get a sense of when you say amortization savings, uh, is it does it mean the same thing as when we look at it from the investment plan perspective? I believe that's cash flow savings because yeah. their payments will be lower. Right. So right now you have, let's say you have a million dollar payment this year and the POBs save you, you only have an $800,000 savings. If in fact that's a lower cash flow savings. And we distinguish amongst what is that makes sense. today's level versus what would be in the future, for example, out way past then. So. Yeah, th that would make sense. Yes. Great. Any other questions, Sunita? Nothing else. Thank you for indulging me. Yeah, no, that's great. As far as anything from you? Yeah, a couple of questions. If I turn to page 24, uh, just to clarify. Um, so here, the say, I guess the difference is, you know, in the inflow outflow, um, we are assuming that with the bonds, you have a higher asset base and that higher returns on the higher asset base is being included in this calculation. The assumption was that you would get a credit. Yes, you do have a higher asset base, but we were focusing on what our liability or payments are, right? And that's the, the most critical part. We're funding, so you would, in this case, you would have $500 million more in asset base. And the way we receive a credit for that, like any kind of investment gain, is over time, and you get addition, you have reduced your annual payments required to be made. This so is the a Korean static. Reduced your payments. This is a static picture of our assumptions, Thank you. right? So as we move along and more layers and credits are added, uh, it would change the picture. This is a static picture of what we would look like Thank you. day one. The day one picture. And obviously, as Bill had noted before, the second year, this will change depending on your investment return. But what we are trying to highlight what the impact of a $500 million POB, the investment credit, a 15-year amortization, and it goes hand in hand with that notion that it, it's escalating over time while our POBs typically borrow level dollar payments. So there's a, somewhat of a mismatch in amortization structure, like the prior slide that I showed. Yeah, but then what does that mean that um, since, you know, assuming that you earn the six and five eight consistently every year, uh, and now you, uh, let's say we do a $500 million POB, uh, the fact that the returns generated by the fund are greater, that benefit accrues to the city, but that's not being included um, on day one. Is that correct? Right, as, as along the way, the earnings performance will add additional layers, mm -hmm. as Bill was saying, so the picture would change, adjust each year. Right, but actually and interesting, if you earn 6.625, this, this static picture would be identical, or maybe you should ask the actuary, but it wouldn't change. Right. Oh, okay. You actually earn the exact rate, which never happens. But if you had, then this this picture would reflect what the position would be. Um, right. So, so if you did the six and five eights identical every year, um, but it's being earned in a higher asset base, is that reflected in this diagram? Is a question. Uh, yes, it is. It is okay. Yeah. 
Assuming that you have the additional 500 million yeah. and you earn six and five eighths yeah. each year in the future. Okay. The difference between the green and the blue is one you get, actually the credit you would have received is the blue and the green, except because the bonds are level. And you, you see, it may be easier if you go to the prior slide that kind of showed an escalating credit versus a level payment, the one before that. Yeah, it's structured a little bit like that such that the credit over time gets to be larger, but our payments are level. So that's, you realize the savings on the back end because of the way the credit is received. Remember the credit escalates, is it two and a half bill or 2.75? I forgot which plan it is. It's two and a half for this plan. Two and a half percent each and every year, the, the payment, the credit increases. That's that escalating component. While our payments and our, our pension bonds are always a level dollar payment. So your credit is effectively increases two and a half percent each and every year until the maturity. Yeah. Okay. If I could turn to the page on the Monte Carlo simulation. And here I'm trying to see if you do like an NPV calculation um, where we compare we take, let's say the, you know, let's say it's a $500 million POB all up front um, versus doing a dollar cost averaging. Let's say we take it over two years. Um, and if you run a simulation in terms of what, uh, you know, based on, I guess it's, you know, I, I guess you, you, you're using certain conditions, I guess. Um, is that a benefit in terms of, doing it over a period of time versus taking it all, all at once? Is that possible to, um, where the benefit is, is, is greater or less in one case? The answer simply is it depends on the outcome of the, of the return. If the market goes down, there's a clear benefit. On the other hand, if we issued last year and you had the fantastic returns you had this year, it would make sense for you to go all in and invest more money on day one. From now, that's one part, that's the, the market return part. The other part is what your borrowing costs are. So we have a two variable component, right? So in, if you issue bonds in two years, but instead of a 3%, just for illustration, Julia, rates go up to 5%, the savings are far less and the outcome would be different. Yeah. I don't think we'd issue bonds at that level, but I'm just doing that to make a simple illustration. So it's a little bit more difficult. So this, by the way, is just here to give you two static models, 500 million, same ending portfolio return that people report, but mm -hmm. different timing. And we're trying to show that the difference is dramatically different if you have positive returns up front, which makes sense. Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you. Anything else thus far? No, that's it, appreciate it. Great. Dick, any questions or comments? Yes, Mr. Chair, and bear with me. I've had uh, several of these presentations and it's still, <clears throat> a lot more for me to feel comfortable with. But it's like, you know, we train for the big fire and we know the risk. And then when we get inside, there's less exits than we'd like. And so what I do, not to put Babu, Prabhu and Roberto on the spot for potential conflict or employments or whatever have you. So I go to my friend Harvey. And I say, Harvey, would you please help me? Have you dealt with this before? and all the different experiences you have in different pension plans to help me understand a little better, knowing the risk, but to hear from you would make me feel a little better. I met today. <laughs> I think I got your uh, question, Dick. Yeah, listen, um, there hasn't been a lot of, in, in the, major pension funds, especially in California, there hasn't been a lot of POB activity in recent, as, as uh, the presentation talks about 2.0 current. Um, and we had some experience uh, going back maybe 15 years um, with POBs uh, when the markets lined up the way they line up now. Um, but, but there's one important point to answer your question, Rick, uh, uh, Dick about um, risk. The, the slides that we've been looking at in the city's presentation um, talk about risk 
from the city's point of view, not from our board's point of view. And uh, the, the excellent discussion that we've been having relating to whether the, whatever the amount of the pension obligation bond proceeds that may come to our board for deployment, it'll be the city's decision whether to fund it all up front or to fund it into the system in tranches over time. And they'll make that decision based upon the risk to the city. The risk that next year it's a great year or next year it's a rotten year. The risk that it proves to be a good bet up front or not a good bet. Those are all risks that the city and the bond rating agencies and, and the advisors to the city are going to tell and the city will make the decision how it wants to handle that risk, take it on, mitigate it, or what it wants to do. From our perspective, the perspective of this board, we're going to either get money in, in a large sum, up front, or we're going to get it over time, or some hybrid. And when we know that, then as I'll discuss in a little while, then we can use our ordinary processes to decide how to deploy the money in order to balance the risk that we always talk about, the risk and reward to our plan. That is a different risk analysis than the risk analysis that you're being presented with today. Does that make sense, Dick? It does, uh, Harvey. That's why I say if I was at a big fire, I would definitely have you the fire chief. I appreciate the answer. Uh, I have a lot more to learn, but you know, I just want to feel comfortable. These are major decisions that affect everybody's lives and investments, and everybody's trying very hard. I've, I've followed the dialogues and, uh, and about with the council and the, our twice our presentations. Um, again, I appreciate the answer. Thank you. Great, thanks, Dick. I can also give you a, kind of a layman's answer, Dick, because I was looking at the same thing. If at any point in time, going back to 1928, I had say borrowed a thousand bucks at three percent interest, and just stuck in the stock market, walked away for 15 or 30 years, and then came back, would I have ever lost money? And the answer is no. no. Not only, Dick, would I have never lost money, I always would have made a lot. But of course, that's right. The stock market over 15 or 30 years is always going up and to the right. It's any given year that's bouncing around. Um, but of course, Dick, the whole problem with this is that the future is never just quite like the past. So, um, Franco, any questions or comments from you? Yeah, I just have one clarifying question. I, I think I know the answer. Um, based on the, the uh, presentation, but this would only be used for the retirement plan and not OPEB, correct? Yes. Yes. Great. Anything else, Franco? Nope, that's it. Dave, anything from you? Yeah, just a clarification on the numbers from the presentation. They mentioned that we were 77% funded, and I think last meeting we talked uh with the return that we had in 2020 we ended up being 85 percent funded can anybody clarify that for me hi uh, hi dave i think that that was my slide what the city focuses on is the actuarial value of assets and i believe what you're referring to is the market value of assets the reason why we focus on the ava is because our city contribution is based on that ava that actuarial value also considers the five-year smoothing that Chiron does in order to, to present that number to us. That, that is correct, uh, Cheryl. Um, you are absolutely right, uh, Dave. And, and you and I haven't had have our one-on-one -on -one yet, but um, that's one of the areas we, we touch on when we spend uh, our first meeting with trustees. So thank you for the explanation, Cheryl. And uh, if, you know, if you ever want to do something different and work for a retirement system, let us know. I think that was a good invitation. Uh, any other questions, Dave? No, thank I you. I don't have any. I don't have any questions. Roberto, do you have any questions or comments you want to weigh in with? 
Uh, no, not really. I mean, other than I just want to bring forward uh, uh, some of the comments that Julia made. I did this at the Fed board meeting. Uh, you know, we're working closely. Uh, we have had meetings, not only the two of us, but also with our staff. And the um, next step is to uh, draft the agenda for the uh, for the upcoming joint meeting. So uh, I, I will invite you to, if there's anything in particular that you would like to key in, that you'd like to hear from the city or the city council, let me know. We'll, tr we'll try to make it part of the agenda. Um, we only have three hours and you'd be surprised how quickly three hours go when you have an interesting theme like it is a POB. <laughs> So, uh, um, you know, I don't, I don't expect it to be many, many items for discussion, but I do expect the items to be included to really expand on the, um, on the discussion at the, at the joint meeting on September 30th. So, and ultimately, I do want to mention one of the uh, first slides that the city included. They spoke about the working the solutions retirement group. And I wanted to remind the board that that group also included uh, the chairs of both boards, uh, as well as I see chairs of both boards and Prabhu and I. So we were part of that group. And ultimately, um, I obviously uh, defer to the city, but I think Julia has been consistent in the message that uh, ultimately the goal of the city here is the sustainability of both plans. And, uh, and so to that extent, obviously, uh, the city will uh, consider their race, the race related to issuing a POB. And uh, we just want to make sure that uh, if a POB is issued, that we uh, make decisions how that amount is going to be implemented. And, and ultimately, depending on how the market returns in the next few months or the next year, I think Julia touched on this as well. Um, Federated is in a uh, lower funded status. So um, I don't want to speak for the city. I'm not even asking the city to ask them that question, but I suspect that if they do issue POB, there's a good chance that it would not be a 50 50 split, meaning that whatever amount they decide to float, there might be maybe some more funds going to Federated than the police and fire. And I say that because obviously the, the amount that would eventually make it to the plan from the POB issuance uh, could have an impact on how we deploy those assets, or those funds. So just wanted you to keep that in mind. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to you, Mr. Chair. Boo, any questions or comments from you? No comments or questions, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you. I see your hand up, Bill. Let me get to Harvey and I'll call on you next. Harvey, any questions or comments? No, thank you. Great, Bill, go ahead and jump in, brother. Yeah, I just had uh, a question for clarification. Uh, I know when I uh, did my example, I assumed a 15 year term, but did I hear that for at least the police and fire plan from the city that you're considering uh, something that would be an even shorter term or can you comment on what kind of term uh, you're looking at specifically for police and fire? Julio, do you want to take that or Nikolai? I mean, yeah, I can. I, I was actually just opening up the model just to have a description. Bill, um, the bases are far shorter and the average of life is shorter for the police and fire. And um, that's one thing. We, When you looked at things, you took an average life, but maybe if you had seen the presentation, there's a little bit more going on behind the scenes. So we are trying to optimize two cash flows. and and I don't want to convolute this from two other plans, but your uh, repayment schedule is one sooner and the amortization is much, they're inversely oriented, where as um, because of the fact that your payments kind of slope downward, it has a much shorter average life and federated continue to slope upward. So I guess the answer would be yes, it would likely be shorter or it would be more, I don't know if the final maturity would be shorter, but the average life would definitely be shorter. Because remember the thing that Nikolai said is that we have a series of bonds. So you might put $10 million in the first 10, uh, $10 million each year for the first seven years and then go downward because to, to match the shape of your cash flows. And I, I think the short answer is if you if the plan's sticking with a 15-year amortization, the final term is likely to be 15. It definitely wouldn't extend. 
it would not be longer, but if, you know, there is flexibility in using like a base selection strategy, you know, that changes um, what the city might consider, but still in the very early stages of considering the structure, but the intent is not to extend. So that's kind of the, the, the symbiotic relationship of, of us understanding what the plan might plan to do with the plan and the plan trying to understand what the city might want to do. Right, and so I was just trying to get clarification on that because uh, 15 years is what we have now, but if you looked at our um, June presentation, um, we did not uh, think the board should let you choose the bases, but uh, there was discussion about matching the term. So if you did a shorter term POV, we would put up for consideration that the board would amortize the credits over the same term. Oh, that's great to know. Now, the, the board would have to look at that and make a decision. The board hasn't made any decisions on that. But um, if, you, if you look at what we said in June, we, we would be matching. We would be recommending matching the term. So if, if we did uh, for just the Federated Police, it was a 10 year, for example, and you're matching the final maturity, is that correct? Then it would be a 10 year credit at the same time, is just to clarify. Uh, that's, that's the initial uh, position I would have, but I would like to see kind of how you've structured it uh, before we made a final decision, but, but we would be, uh, recommending something that matches up well with the way that you structured the bond. We wouldn't want to be completely blind to how the bond was structured. It's very encouraging. Right. Uh, Nikolai, go ahead. I see you got your usually have your hand up. Go ahead, Nikolai. I, I think one of the things that I would just highlight out of this, this conversation is that uh, we are approaching this not as a, a one and done exercise. Um, I think we are approaching this with developing policies, whether whether the council decides to to issue bonds next year or over time. Um, and hopefully those policies will give you some transparency and, and idea of how the, the city intends to proceed. And perhaps uh, something to consider would be developing uh, reciprocal kinds of policies um, for the different scenarios, rather than each of us trying to decide based on the moving targets of each other. Yeah, yeah, that's that's. I think that's exactly the way we think about it, Nikolai. Um, floors open. Anybody want to jump in? Anybody city? Anybody free? Feel free to jump in. Um, if not, boy, Nikolai, you could not have kicked off Harvey's piece better. So in, in sort of the, the words that Nikolai just gave us, let, let's sort of view this as um, Julia and her staff come to us and say, hey, would you like some more money? And we say, oh, um, thank you, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Um, how high would you like me to jump, ma'am? Right? And Nikolai then says, you know, the whole thing might be a little bit better if we sort of coordinate. And now Harvey is going to tell us the limits of coordination. So go ahead, Harvey. Well, I'm not sure that's exactly what I was going to tell you. <laughs> oh, I know. What, what, I, what, I, what I took from Nikolai's comments, and I think it's, it's very important, um, is that this is still a work in process. And um, uh, stepping back, listen, I've, I've given the board a confidential memorandum kind of telling you where the chalk lines are um, in terms of the board's responsibilities to, to the plan. And uh, that's still a confidential memorandum. I, I don't have a slide presentation to summarize it. I'm not going to summarize it. Um, but one of the conclusions that I can, you know, publicly that I want to leave with you is that however money comes into the system, to the plan, uh, regardless of the source that the city gets the money from. And, and Linda, I think we can uh, uh, take down that, um, we, don't, we don't need to share a screen on the, on the agenda right now. 
a little easier to see people if we don't have that up. Yeah, thanks. Um, whatever, however the money comes, if it comes from the city issuing pension obligation bonds, if the city, if the city has federal money that comes in, if the city has reserves that it wishes to use, it's extremely important for our board to understand that regardless of the source of that money and the risk reward decisions that the city will make in how, whether to put that money with the pension fund and, and the bang it gets for the buck in doing that that we not disrupt the processes and procedures that we have in place for deploying money and ultimately deciding how to actuarially fund the system in a sound way, which then leads to contribution rates. I wanna get back to that, to that in a minute. Um, so my advice to you is pretty unremarkable. Um, but it's also uh, difficult for all of us under the circumstances still at this point, uh, because we don't know how much money is being contemplated. We don't know how much is projected in terms of timing to come in. And so we can only speculate about what we might do on if then scenarios of, about how that may impact the city's decision. Um, I, I want to point out that earlier this morning, um, we had a report from, our, uh, from Laura Weirich, who I think is still on, uh, that in the first quarter of this year, our fund made earn $300 million. Um, last year, we earned multiples of that. So in the first quarter of this year, we took in $300 million. We didn't create a new amortization schedule for that money. We didn't change our asset allocation, uh, recognizing that money. We are long-term investors and we are long-term determinants of the actuarial soundness of the system. And whether it's 300 million or 500 million, the board has a process that it follows for determining what your risk balance tolerance is with the, with the investment of the assets and the cash flows that we need to pay benefits. And those are decisions that you make every single year, whether you bring in 300 million or you lose 300 million. And of course we adjust those from time to time, but the important thing from the point of view of our board is that we have processes in place and that our obligation is to have a sound, deliberative, fact-gathering, fact-based um, evaluation of our risk and reward tolerances and how we think we should deploy money over time. I, I wanna come back to a point that um, on one of the earlier slides uh, well, it was Chiron, Bill, Bill, it was one of your slides that I asked you about the tier one thing. This is a defined benefit plan where there are no, this isn't a 401k uh, or a, def, a defined contribution plan. This is a defined benefit plan. All of the assets that we shepherd are there to pay all the benefits for all the members of our plan. So, um, we don't earmark funds for tier one benefits or funds for tier two benefits. There is a difference, of course, between under, under the city's law as to how, how they split that normal cost, the normal cost being the benefit that is earned by each member in the year of service. That cost for our tier one members was split you know, eight, I think it was three parts to the member and eight parts to the city. Under tier two, they're splitting that cost 50-50. But that has nothing to do with the money and the assets that we take in. If we need them to pay benefits to tier two people, it goes to tier two people. So we can't pick and choose 
if money comes in, whether investment earnings or pension obligation bonds or something, we can't say, oh, we're going to use this money solely to pay tier one benefits. That's not how the system works. So we, we need to keep that in mind. There are no separate accounts. We can't say we're gonna pay this liability for tier one. And if there is an unfunded liability for tier two, we're not going to apply it there. It comes into the system, the money comes into the system, it gets um, deployed and it is there for all the benefits. The other point I wanna leave with you at this stage is contribution rates, especially for the unfunded liability portion of the contributions, contribution rates are the end result of our policies that we apply, not the beginning. They derive from our investment policies, our expected rate of return, our evaluation of the capital markets projections, our evaluation of the benefit streams that we have to pay over time. We don't, we don't reverse engineer all of the management of the system based upon a desired contribution rate. We manage the system, we administer the system, we make actuarial determinations, we, we uh, come up with amortization schedules for the purpose of managing the cash flows that come into the system and, and the need to pay the benefits in a timely fashion as they come due now in over 30 years. And at the end of that evaluation, plus our, our, our capital deployment, our asset allocation. This is all comes from our asset liability studies. At the end of that, we say, okay, this leads to a contribution rate for the employer of X and the employee of Y. And that's how, and we need that money. That becomes the ARC, the actuarially required contribution. We don't start with a desired percentage contribution and reverse engineer the management of the system from that. So I want you to keep that in mind. Now I have given you um, in the memorandum that I prepared for you, I've discussed a particular case, but there are a number of cases where the, where the courts recognize that a board like this board has wide latitude in making these kind of funding decisions. And particularly in the San Diego example that I gave you, the courts upheld the board's exercise of its judgment in terms of recognizing the contribution relief that was provided to the plan sponsor, in that case, the county, that issued pension obligation bonds and put that money into the system. In that case, it was some $500 million. And it was paying towards the unfunded liability it created, the county created when it went to a higher benefit formula. That created a big unfunded liability and the city didn't want to be hit with that. But the board had a lot of discretion in how to stage and whether to recognize that money and on what basis to recognize it. And so, unlike Drew, what you said uh, that, that um, Nikolai was teeing off a conversation about the restrictions that might be on our judgment. My real point is, is that if we follow our normal processes and deliberations in making our administrative decisions for how to run the system, how to handle the cash flows we need in the system, how to deploy the money in the public and private markets, that we have a lot of latitude after that in deciding how to manage the contribution streams that are coming in from the city as a consequence of making all those decisions. As long as we follow a deliberative and prudent process that's the best approach that we can do. So at this point, it's 
this is, you know, it's kind of um, chicken and egg, I'll find some guests on, whatever you want. Whichever comes first, it's difficult to tell. But right now, we don't yet have enough. POBs is a broad term, as the presentation shows. It's a broad term for a lot of different funding vehicles that cities and counties and states use to bargain that they can borrow at a lower rate than they are than their pension funds can earn. And that's their risk assessment. But until we know the amount and whether it's going to come in in one lump sum or over time and for how long it's going to come in, and as Bill says, what the debts, you know, how long the city's going to have that debt service on those bonds. We're not yet at the point where we can plug and play with our current processes. When we get those fundamentals from the city, we can then plug them into our normal processes. We can even do an accelerated asset liability study at that point. There's no reason we can't do that to recognize what would be the impact if the money comes in in the middle of a fiscal year, for example, the middle of a contribution year. So we have a lot of tools. We just need to be given the raw materials first, and then we can go to work. So if I haven't mixed enough metaphors, in, <laughs> somebody let me know. Uh, but um, that's basically what I want message at this stage I'd like to leave to the board is that we don't disrupt our ordinary processes. The same processes that are in place that took in and deployed $300 million in a single quarter this year. Let's not disrupt our processes. They're sound and we can tailor them to the needs and, and the predictability the city is asking for once we get a little more fundamental information about what's being contemplated. Happy to take any questions that you might have. Yeah, let me, let me make one comment first. The floor is open to everyone on this call. I, I would say, Harvey, that what Cheryl and Nikolai both said concretely matches what you've just said. They both went out of the way to say, I'm not telling you what to do. Floor is open. If anybody has any for city, any trustees, any staff, go ahead, jump in. Well, uh, I'm happy. I'm happy to go first if no one else is jumping in. But um, <laughs> Arvi, uh, I always find your comments very incredibly useful. It keeps me grounded on my role as a trustee on this board. I think where I'm, I'm sort of uh, struggling with is when I um, when I see Bill's presentation. It was excellent. It's not a criticism on his presentation. There are variables there that get me confused. Things like the debt service of the of the city. Um, so I, I wonder if it, when we when we get closer to a voting point where we can say that that is not a variable that really concerns us as a, as a trustee of the investment board um, and, and sort of maybe separate the considerations of the city much clearer, make it more black and white versus sitting here in the investment board. And, you know, we're all humans. And so when these things get discussed, there is a certain sort of swaying of responsibility, so to speak. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. And I know, I know Bill's sensitive to that as well. And, you know, that one slide that Bill had that had that little green ribbon running through the middle that was the debt service, that was a, a city lens slide, not a pension board lens well, slide. So you're you're absolutely right, um, and I appreciate the comment. Thank you. I had one other thing. Uh, I know you were not here last board meeting, but there was some discussion around whether, as the investment board, and we could take this at a, you know, with, since your memo is confidential, we could do this at a closed session. You, you, we'll defer to you. But uh, there was some discussion that our input is necessary for the city to decide, or or rather, we do have a say in 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 the fact that. Uh, because the city is on the hook for paying the plan over time on whether the that if, if it materially de deteriorates their credit position by borrowing, 
we do have a say in it because as a fiduciary, we need to inform the city. Is that the case or um, am I making sense? I'm not quite following. Well, let's say the it's city has- It's not our role. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry, please. Sorry, let me just say this a little differently. I, getting my thoughts together. If the city decides to borrow a tremendous amount of money to fund this, and that materially deteriorates their credit standing, which I know is not the case right now, absolutely not. Um, do we have any obligation to advise the city that that would compromise their future obligation to the plan? No, we have no paternalism uh, assignment vis-a-vis -vis the city. Okay, cool. Uh, that's not our role. We could, we can, if we see something that alarms us and makes us worry that the city as our sole plan sponsor may be in dire financial straits, then we might want to say something because well, that would concern us. But that is, the city's financial capabilities is something that the city is absolutely qualified to determine for itself. And the rating agencies will price their bonds accordingly based upon their independent review of the city's financial capabilities and stability and financial management. That's not something that is our role to step into that mix and try to influence that, that decision making. If the, if, the, if the three rating agencies thought that the city couldn't handle the POB, they wouldn't be getting the ratings and the pricing that they're getting or being offered. And, and now I'm stepping way beyond my knowledge base and you know, the, the folks from the city, Julia or, or, or Nicola, I might wanna comment on that, but um, that's not our responsibility. That's one thing you can take off your checklist of, of having to worry about. Good, thanks for confirming our intuition. I appreciate that, yeah. I mean, I think, uh, I think uh, Drew said it earlier. I mean, if you're, if you're given money to invest at any point of time, it does help, uh, it helps the investment plan. It doesn't hurt the investment plan. So, so I know that's not what we're making a decision on today, but thank you, appreciate it. Thanks, and floor is open. Anybody else have anything? Once, Grinch. All right. Well, so I'm going to exert chairman's prerogative. I'm going to drive for a bit. So there's a lot to synthesize here. We've obviously got some really smart people on this call. And somehow we've got to sort of climb this Mount Everest that we're putting in front of ourselves. So let me tell you the punchline to what I'm about to give you. The punchline has three pieces. It's pretty straightforward. The first piece is this whole discount rate thing. It's both a plan and a forecast. We, we distill a lot of stuff down into a single number. So let's remember that that number is not just a forecast. It's also a plan of how we will deploy our assets. And let's remember that plans that drive forecasts are always subject to the old adage that no plan of battle ever survived first contact with the enemy. As has been said by multiple people here, we will never hit our discount rate. Some years will be higher, some years will be lower, right? But having said that, what I said to Dick earlier and I, and I said to Julio earlier is true. Given history since the Great Depression, there has never been a period where, where just sticking the money in the stock market didn't earn a hell of a lot more than 3%. That was Vince's comment from the last board meeting. He set me up on an odyssey um, to look into that. And so we always have the, the, here's the, here's the punchline, the Cassandra question, right? Cassandra could see the future. And we ask her, ooh, Cassandra, is the future like the past? Is it going up and down? But over time, it's going up and to the right. And if she said, yes, Mr. Lonza, the future is like the past, then crap doodles, let's do this all day long, every day. Let's get the plan funded immediately. But of course, Cassandra says, nah, the future's never quite like the past. Don't ask me again, right? And so what we're looking to get here, and I think Julia, you and your staff and Cheryl did a great job. We're not looking for an answer. And Nikolai really said it well. We're looking for a process, right? We're looking for things that dovetail. And the goal of the process is not to give us a number. The goal of the process 
is to be very adaptable. And we damn well know this works because that's what we did last year that generated all those returns. We built a system that could adapt to a market downturn and we played that fiddle so well, we almost won an Academy Award. Well, I'm mixing metaphors, Grammy. All right, so let me go ahead and pull up some slides here. Um, come on. Um, that's weird. Um, let me do this. No, oh, sorry, that was a problem. Here we go, all right. Can y'all see that? So these are, Oh, yes. these, are my, these are my thoughts. The board may choose, and, and I am welcome to disagree with me. I, I just including thoughts on where to go from here. And I, I think Harvey's right. We're sort of in the middle of a, of a joint process. How do we continue to work jointly? Right? So there will be um, a couple of themes in a slide or two. But I said before, so where are we in space and time? Well, look. Julia and, and Urban Futures are saying, well, it looks attractive as a city. And we're saying, as Sunita said, right, more money is good for us. A better funded plan is better for us. We, at least if the future is anything like the past, the past, it's a lot better for us. So the city is asking us what we hear to be a reasonable, prudent question. So guys in the PNF plan, if we were to give you money, what might you do with it? We're not going to tell you what to do with it, but what might you do with it so we can run our analysis? That is a reasonable, prudent question. So I would suggest that we respond in a reasonable, with a reasonable, prudent answer, and here are the caveats. And Nick, Malai, and Cheryl talked with caveats. Look, our, our thinking like yours is evolving. That's Nikolai, you know, sort of saying, you know, maybe there's, there's a, a a process here where we, we have back and forth that benefits us both without compromising either one of ours, either one of our fiduciary um, duties. Look, we are not going to give you an opinion on whether or not you should issue POVs. That's on you, right? I think we can give you some math that may lead you to have some confidence that it would be a good thing to do. And we hear your desire for contribution relief. It doesn't drive our thinking but it's one of a dozen factors. It's one of a dozen knobs on the wall that we have in sight. We, we hear you, we understand that. And to the extent that you might say, hey, you know, give us a little bit of contribution relief, we'll give you a ton of cash, we are listening. Um, that doesn't mean you get to tell us what the contribution relief looks like, but it means, it means Bill will be able to tell us prudently from an actuarial standpoint, and as Harvey said too, what some of those knobs on the wall might be. All right, and again, the most important thing, the punchline, it's not about a number. It's about a system that adapts. And let me, when we look at, I'm, I'm a VC, I do startup companies. So people always miss their plans, right? And we always break it down along three axes. Was it something due to us or something external? Was it something we could have done with better performance or is it just luck, right? And finally, is it something we should have seen coming or something unexpected? The only threats, now we have to do more numbers, but, but you, know, you heard from Julio and, and Monte Carlo too, the only threats we have are external bad luck unexpected. People fly airplanes into buildings. All of a sudden, three years from now, they cure cancer and our mortality rates change dramatically. Concretely, all of a sudden, we're in a period where inflation looks very different than it has since 1928, and that's impacted us and all of our other pension systems. So we do all this, we should be able to work with the city. All right, so four core themes, okay? I think this is the most important one. You, you hear Julio, you hear some of the people doing their job and saying, let's start to talk about how we optimize this. And I think he's doing his job, but let me answer the by saying, let's not do that. I think Julio, we, I, I'll brag a little, we have a really smart board and we are surrounded by really smart people like you. Let's not do the optimization step now. Let's, I was talking, I just came by, I was talking to a math friend of mine, he said, Drew, why are you trying to figure out the best answer? Just figure out if there's an answer. Because if there's an answer, there's many answers. And one of those is like gonna be an awesome answer. And Julio is giving us insight that he's saying, well, you want a better answer. Don't 
plunk all your money in at the top of the market. Okay, well, not plunking all your money in the top of the market, as Hulo said, is tricky, right? The dollar cost averaging, do I buy a hedge? I mean, people think about this all the time. So let's work with the city to figure out if there is an approach, and we'll talk about one later in this slide, and Bill already talked about one. You saw some of the slides from the city, right? And then as Harvey said, wait until the city says, you know, that's enough information. I think we're kind of ready to go forward in urban futures and us. Here are, I think, the parameters of a POB. You heard Bill use one set of assumptions. You heard a different set of assumptions uh, in Julio's presentation and when see his presentation, and you're going to hear yet a different set of assumptions now. Harvey's right. I think our, we're thinking, Julia, we'll give you confidence that you're not crazy. I mean, of course, you already know you're not. And then you give us confidence around the parameters, and then we can start to really kick around what's the right thing to do. Again, the risk in this is that the future doesn't look like the past. If the future looks like the past, this is a no-brainer. The, the, the lowest 30-year period is something in the equities market, something like 8% return, geometric. I mean, that's 5% more than three, the 3% you'd be getting in debt. So there are three obvious, simple, generic approaches, and we've actually talked about them since our June meeting. So, and I, I say I say in the slide here, is I say noodling. These are not proposals. These are things people have just sort of said. So Prabhu kind of last month said, you know, I think we'd probably keep the discount rate the same. Because, yeah, there's a little bit larger risk from a larger portfolio because we have... A, this is the thing that, that Julio was talking about. You got a big portfolio, we hit a downturn, ouch. We just left a bigger hole. We just lost more money and the city will have to make that up a bigger hole, larger contributions, right? But on the other hand, we're about 85% market funded. So that's good news, bad news, call it a day. Um, there we go. Um, Vince, is, Vince sort of had an approach which led to the same discount rate. Vince was the one that said, man, just stick in the stock market. Right, just so he gives 200 million, stick in the stock market and leave it there for you know 15 years. If the future's like the past, it always does well. And I raise the noodle. I'm not suggesting this or proposing this, right? That maybe there's a little more to be taken out of our discount rate. We are 85% funded, but as Prabhu said in his update, boy, we are in a a, a very high market, uh, the, I think a Schiller PE is near its all time high, blah, 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 okay, so, right? Again, um, the core theme is let's find an answer, give the city confidence, take the next step, hopefully a month or two, give us, this is what we're thinking about in terms of the four or five key numbers in the POB and take it from there, right? And then, and then we can say, well, what's the best strategy? It might be one of these. It might be something totally out of the box. And as we heard from Eileen and Harvey in August, guys, you're 85% funded market. If the market holds for a bit, you're going to be close to 100% funded. And Bill has always said, and Eileen and Harvey said last month, you get near 100% funded, it's a very different game, right? So that we, we may be, you know, knock wood, we may be near that trajectory. And so we may want to think about what we're going to do with the numbers, integrating a little bit of that notion that we, if the city gives us enough money, I don't think you will, Julia, we might be heading towards 100% funding and time to tap the brakes or whatever you do when you get to 100% funding. All right, no brainer. It's a model. Bill's got the model. Bill, Bill ran some numbers for us. Look. The model has two basic inputs from the city. Now we're looking at city lens, right? Harvey said there's a city lens, and we're going to help the city a bit here. They asked us a real question. So the first lens is everybody. How big is the POB? How much do we get, right? The second lens is our independent decision. As Harvey says, um, if we have more money, does that impact our discount rate? That's what we had on the previous slide. And there's one key output the city's concerned with that we're not really concerned with, and that is the city's annual contribution. So the model has these basic inputs and outputs. It's a crude model. So what are the assumptions? Well, the assumption model, first of all, is that the future will be like the past. 
It was the, the, the assumption that Julio, when Julio said he ran Monte Carlo, I assume he ran Monte Carlo using historical inputs. Um, we are also assuming, as Harvey said, that our discount rate is set by looking at tolerable volatility. Volatility is not quite the same as risk, but they, but they um, are in the same sphere of influence. We take a volatility, 12%, the various thing from our offsite two or three years ago. We use that to drive an asset allocation. And then we ask um, um, McKeith and Barris, okay, what would we expect that asset allocation to do over the next 10 or 20 years? And that drives our discount rate, right? We will sort, shortly look at numbers that have the same shock that Barris gave us at our offsite two years ago at Hayes Mansion. Um, it's a 25% market drawdown, 12% uh, volatility. There it is, May 2018. Um, then Chiron ran numbers, and um, Bill Bill wants to make sure we all know the numbers we're about to see. We incorporated that great year. Thanks, Prabhu and Roberto and, and all your staff. Um, Bill Bill chose. Bill said, "I think let's let's amortize that credit over 15 years. Matches what we do." Um, and then we, you know, you get this little contribution thing. I ignore all this stuff. And so far, everybody's everybody's giving you models. These numbers are kind of bouncing around. That's why the next step is we sort of need the city to kind of lock us down on, on what they're doing. Um, and Andrew? then a final, go ahead, jump in. I'm so sorry. Um, we have to take a five minute break for Civic Center. Okay, uh, so we'll take a five minute break and come back. What, what time we got now? It's 1.05. Yeah, let's come back in five minutes at 10 after. No worries, let's do that. Thank you. I'm gonna grab something to drink.
I was really rolling too. Thanks, Ashbar. <laughs> Thank you. That's good. Um, so here's an example: Sit the city lens, as Harvey says, and we'll you we'll show how we see it, and then expand that to how the city might see it. You've seen examples from Bill. You've seen examples from Julio. Slightly different inputs. Here is the set of inputs um, we chose to use. This is the point. So here we go, City. We think we got these. I know Prabhu kind of talked to you guys. We think we're in the general vicinity. We're not off by a factor of two. And then hopefully, you know, in some short period of time, you'll kind of narrow this down, right? Like Julia said, maybe the city issues a bunch and, and we give more to Federated than you guys. All right. So here's the analysis. Okay. And the analysis. Um, is based on a simple chart. So we just asked Bill, really simple Bill, for three different discount rates, where we are today, slightly higher, slightly lower, for no POV or 250 million, 500 million dollar POV, Bill, level, pay, level payments, give us an idea what the city contributions are if we hit our discount rate, if the market's good, and if we have that reference shock that Varys gave us at our offsite at the Hayes Mansion, okay. So we put that in the model, crank it out. And the punchline is, if we keep the current discount rate or only increase or decrease it slightly per the table, then the city contribution always decreases. With no POB, here's their annual level contribution, right? With a lower discount rate, it goes down with a higher discount, with the same discount rate, it goes down. Of course it does, we've got more money. And with a higher discount rate, it goes down a lot, okay? Now, put your city lens hat on. Okay, well, hang on. I've got to do some debt service and I've eventually got to repay the bond, okay? And so if we lower the discount rate, it's a basically a wash to the city. It's It's... It's 132 million versus 134 million in level contribution. Oh, that's pretty good. That makes sense, right? Now let's ask what happens if we get an economic shock. So we get this bad news, right? This turns out to be the same thing. Even, even if we get our standard reference shock, it's not the worst economic calamity of the last 100 years, but a 25% drawdown is something to sneeze at. And this, by the way, was the number I said earlier. It was the number I got wrong. I've corrected this, and the revised version will be uploaded um, after this meeting. We get the same thing. So the punchline is smooth sailing. It always lowers your contribution to us. Reference shock, it always lowers your contribution to us. Now, Sid, you have to do some more math and figure out whether it makes sense to you because it isn't just your contribution, it's service on the on the bond um, plus the payback of the bond. And if you really look carefully at these numbers, they're not quite as good as the previous page because again, in a reference shock, we could a hole and a bigger total pension fund with, with POVs added creates a slightly bigger hole, which means the city has to pay back a little bit more each year to fill in a slightly bigger hole. So here is an example that puts it all together. Again, you've seen an example from Bill, you've seen an example from Olia. So based on Bill, at our existing discount rate, here's what the annual city contributions look like, no POB. You've seen this slide before from both Bill and Julio. You add the POB, right? And the city contributions go down. You can say, well, suppose they're they're paying three percent on two hundred fifty million. That's the blue bar. What they wow, what it went down because of your POV plus some service on it. And look, I'm just an engineer. And then you got to pay it back. Let's say you pay it back over this period of time. Again, we don't know the nature of this, but you can see, right, that this is good to the city. So the the question you've asked us, I think, is what might you do with that? Well, this is what we might do with that. Okay. And it looks pretty good. But when we actually go to figure out what we're going to do with it, we're going to use every smart brain on the planet to give you an optimal. 
to give us an optimal solution, to give you, your retirees, the pension plan, an optimal solution. So that's, that's, that's it. So I, I guess the, the message conveyed is, the punchline is, man, the future is unwritten. And, and if it's not like the past, this can go sideways, right? But if it is like the past, then in almost every scenario, this makes sense. In every scenario, it makes sense to us. More money is good. And in most of these scenarios, based on some simple assumptions, it makes sense um, to the city. So let me go ahead and do do the round robin we've done before. Andrew, any questions you might have? Uh, none, thank you. Great. Um, Sunita, any questions or comments? No, oh, Drew, thanks. Well summarized. Appreciate the presentation. Great. Eshvar? Yeah, thank you, Drew. Uh, so yeah, I think uh, great. Uh, you know, you have a passion for this, uh, you know. so. Uh, the one thing I would say, uh, and I've said this before, uh, I'm kind of in the Prabhu camp in terms of what we do with the money. But the other thing is also what Harvey said, which is that, you know, when it comes to the discount rate setting and the asset allocation, those are separate processes. Um, and we treat it the same. And, you know, if we have to change the discount rate, that's a separate process. We don't do it because of POB. Because like Harvey said, it's like, you know, the fund is, you know, you have 300 million last quarter, um, you know, in a way it's, you know, you face the same risks, uh, you know, uh, other than some operational stuff in terms of putting the money to work. So I would not, you know, I think those things should be treated separately, um, you know, in terms of what we do, irrespective of, you know, the POB or not. Yeah, I, you know, I think that's right. And Pr Prabhu always reminds me that you know, the discount rate at some level is a very kind of long-term prediction of where you're going over a long period of time. And your asset allocation strategy should be bouncing along because you don't want the same asset allocation strategy. You may want the same discount rate for 20 years. You sure as hell don't want the same asset allocation strategy for 20 years. Right. So they are not the same thing. Um, they are related, right? You don't want to have an asset allocation that's returning 2% and a discount rate of eight. Right? Makes sense. What, what I'm saying is each of those, those are two separate things, the discount rate and the asset allocation, but they right. should independently, each of those run independently of the pension obligation bond. I'm not saying that those two are necessarily linked. I'm just saying there's two separate processes which we already have. You know, we set the asset allocation once a year or more often as needed. Um, and then we discuss the, the discount rate periodically, you know. Yeah. And I think we continue with those as and when needed, uh, but not let the pension obligation board influence each of those. Yeah, I think that's right. I, I think we can say, um, you know, sort of independent of that, look, S&P recommends a discount rate as low as six and a half percent for Paul. I mean, we're not going to pick a discount rate of one percent, right? So, yeah. All right. Any any other comments? No, that's that's it. Thank you, Drew. Okay, great, Dick. Any comments? Well, yeah. Thank you for all your work, and I think the key to it, you said, let's get started and work with the city to find out all the answers. So, thank you so much. No, yeah, thanks, Dick. Uh, Franco, any comments? No, I'm good. Dave, any comments? No, thank you. Uh, Roberto, any comments? Um, well, first, that I mentioned before that we have trustees that are very engaged. And so there's an example of an engaged trustee. So thank you, Drew. <laughs> Much appreciated. And uh, really, the second one, uh, you know, I'm not going to uh, extend the discussion. I think uh, Eswar made a very good point, which I think Prabhu has made in the past. Uh, there are two independent uh, processes, the discount rate and the asset allocation. They are obviously related, but they're independent. So, you know, we just have to keep, uh, keep uh, that in mind. That's all. But thank you. Thank you very much, Drew. Uh, you're very welcome. Prabhu, any thoughts or comments? Great discussion, Drew. Thank you. No comments. No, uh, Harvey? No, all good. Thank you, Drew. Well done. Great. Great. Um, floor is open. I'm Julie. I, I hope you guys found that helpful.
I didn't want to give you a number, but I want to give Do you a Nikolai, process. Nikolai, I think, raise his hand. Nikolai, yeah, Nikolai go ahead, jump in. Any, any floor's open. Jump in, guys. Go ahead, Nikolai. Thank you very much, and appreciate uh, the chair's comments and, and uh, Harvey's comments as well. And uh, I, I wanted to just make sure to uh, share again the point that the city council has not yet decided to do POBs. They had the study session in April at, a, at the May 11th uh, meeting. They directed staff to have uh, discussions with the, the, the boards to, to set up that dialogue and to begin the process of uh, creating the tools to make this, this financing tool available. Um, if council were to vote on Tuesday to issue POBs, we couldn't do that right now. Um, right. So uh, we have to go through this judicial uh, validation process. The council will consider the actual validation uh, process on September 21st, and then we will have the, the meeting uh, with you. I think as we go forward um, in doing the analysis for council, uh, what will be important to understand is what are the, the rules of the road? Um, and if, if the council makes a decision to borrow and then this, the board changes amortization policies or dramatically changes discount rates, that dramatically changes the, the economic modeling. But I think we can all uh, perhaps agree that um, over the long term, if if this board or an, either board isn't achieving a two or three percent return, uh, we have we have other challenges regardless of whether we do POEs or not. So um, it, the the fact that we can lock in rates in this market uh, that are so low um, allows us to begin to uh, pin down some of these variables and what we hope to do with those policies that we've been describing is take some of the guesswork out of what might the city side do uh are we going to try to re-amortize uh, i think we've shared that's not what we're trying to do we're we're trying to improve the the funding status but ultimately um the council will still need to uh, make decisions about first the validation process, and then ultimately, before any individual bonds are issued, they would need to be approved again. Thanks. Yeah, great. So, so I think you're you're really hitting the nail on the head there, Nikolai. So, you know, like I said, I'm kind of a knucklehead. So I wandered around to all the players and said, "Gee, if the city gave us 250 million, might we do something impactful? You know, something radical?" And everybody said, "No," but everybody also said. But if they give us a lot of money, we get close to 100% funding, then we really might do something impactful. So I think part of the message here is, there's, and we don't know yet because we haven't done all the analysis, but nobody's saying, boy, really start turning the knobs in that control room. I can also um, tell you, Nikolai, sort of per your comment that we will have to work together to make um, this happen. Of course, as Harvey says, we have our own independent decisions. But we need to be in, syn in synchronization, right? We may, we may, for instance, try to convince you guys don't issue the POB right now because the market's near peak. I mean, there's this dialogue in my forth. And I talked to my counterpart, um, Spencer, the chairman of Federated. I've also spoken to Roberto in Peru about this. If the city says to go forward, I think we will form a joint committee and so when you guys are dealing with us, you'll only be dealing with one committee representing both boards. I don't think we want to have a Tower of Babel situation here. Floor is open. Any other questions? Comments? All right. Um, so I guess, Julia, I mean, sort of, and, and Nicholas said, sort of balls in, in your court. Um, I think, you know, Bill's, Bill's got his models fired up and ready to go. So as you sort of get closer to what you think, and I think, you know, Julio, I think gave us some much better granularity than we've seen before. Let us give the numbers and we'll keep cranking stuff. And then when you guys say, I think we're getting, this is getting pretty real. Then I think we really put our heads together and answer what's the best 
way to invest the, this money. I think we'll, we'll call on you, um, Urban Futures, as we start to think about how do we cover or hedge our downside risk independent of the city. It's, it's We think risk is a big deal. So, all right, uh, we're on to compensation right now. So item 4G. Um, so let me let me turn briefly to Ashfar. So Ashfar, I know that you and Roberto and Anya are on the federated side have met to discuss. We're not supposed to talk about any specifics um, of a performance review, um, but maybe you can give us some guidance as to what you three thought overall about Prabhu's performance um, as sort of an intro to our discussion about compensation. Yeah, so uh, I'm not exactly sure of the rules, but let me try to make sure I stay within those. Uh, so uh, we at the board had a discussion about Prabhu's performance uh, and my conversation with Anurag in terms of, and, and with Roberto, uh, in terms of Roberto's view and the federated board view uh, was very much in line with what we discussed at our board meeting. Um, and uh, so uh, nothing different. Uh, our reviews are very similar to what we discussed at the board. And uh, so the, you know, the, the views of our board, you know, fully reflect the re final review for Prabhu. Is that, uh, or I, I trust I shouldn't say anything more. But... Remember, the, remember the session and the remarks we all um, made about Prabhu. Um, I'll point out that Again, as we said earlier, you don't really measure somebody on if they beat their discount rate. You measure somebody on if they beat their benchmark, right? That's that notion of alpha we talked about. And 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 I, I asked Prabhu this just yesterday, and he sent my note saying, we, we beat our benchmarks in almost every category of asset we invest in. So that's, it could be luck, but I doubt it. If it's across all assets, it's a measure of um, what a good job Prabhu and his staff um, have done giving us that little extra leg up from smart people doing smart things in a timely way. Um, so I met with um, Spencer um, and we've had the review of Roberto and I, I think I would echo what Eshvar said. Um, you know, we all know what a great job Roberto did during the pandemic. We discussed that in closed session. Um, and and so I think you know we we think very highly in terms of of any approach to increasing his compensation. So in the in the charter that uh, establishes a chairman for this board and duties, you have delegated to to me sort of the ability to be a labor is called labor negotiator, and I have of course then delegated that down. To Eshwar, which is also my prerogative to do that for the CIO, which is easier because Roberto is part of that whole process. So we kind of have two ways we can go forward now as a board, as we sort of merge items 4G and 4H and talking about both the CIO and the CEO compensation. I've I've spoken with my counterpart on Federated, um, and I have sort of a proposal for compensation. I'm not sure that's the right way to proceed. Harvey says, maybe Drew just gather a range um, from your board. And of course, whatever we recommend federated in a couple of weeks, we'll have to look at and that. Um, so just sort of in the background, we, we, we gave um, them both 5% merit increases last year. And the general consensus, I, I hope I can sort of speak for the group of labor negotiators, is that we give Prabhu a very large merit increase of, of say 10% and give Roberto a very large merit increase of seven and a half percent. Prabhu's to reflect on the absolutely outstanding performance um, and, and Roberto's to reflect on something very different. I, I, I joked with Roberto in his review. I, Roberto, you made the process of Zoom and a pandemic fun, which has got to be really hard. I'm sitting in nine or 10 boards now. And I told Roberto, of all the CEOs I'm working with, I think Roberto and your staff, and Roberto said, well, Drew, it's not me, it's my staff, handled this whole transition to virtual meetings better than any other board I'm on. I'm on some, some technology boards, you know, where they absorb the tech very quickly, but didn't, 
as you did so well, Robert, sort of, sort of absorb the ethos and change in culture. So that's kind of a, I, I, we're, I, but unfortunately, I'm a battlefield promotion, so I wasn't sitting in the meetings last year, nor was Eshvar, as you recall. He, he wasn't sitting was really in those meetings either. Um, so let me open the floor and just get your input. Andrew, you, you're sort of an old hand at this. What, what do you sort of think in terms of compensation or how this board should go forward on this? Can you hear me now? Uh, we can. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so, you know, over the last two, two, three years, we've been trying to morph and, and, and create a parallel um, uh, evaluation process. Uh, we, we currently have the, um, the city's uh, MPP guidelines, which we follow. Um, and then we've been working with Cortex and the JPC has been working together uh, to uh, provide a more in-depth and also one that um, is more focused on the CEO and CIO position. Um, and, and, and we've been, we've all experienced that uh, this year with, uh, you know, we, in the last week or two, we got um, emails from Cortex, you know, to fill out a, you know, a questionnaire. Um, and that's going to be going out to, you know, starting next year, we'll be rolling it out full time. And this is more of a trial run. Um, and part of that is also is to sort of revamp the uh, merit increases um, associated with their performance review. Um, in the last several years, we have, um, you know, with starting, I think, when, when Vince was chair and then myself the previous year, um, we have gone above and beyond the recommendations um, of the MPP um, for merit increases. Um, and we, we did that for a few reasons. One was we realized we have some very high caliber um, uh, uh, CIO and CEO on board, um, and they have you know done so much for this plan, and they should be rewarded appropriately. And then also we compared it to you know where they were in their pay scale compared compared to the pair um, peers. Uh, we did a compensation um, study uh, amongst our peers um, back in 2018, and that helped us formulate our guide or our ranges for um, the CEO and CIO positions. Um, so part of the 5% uh, raises for the last few years was to get them in a position where we felt they were deserved to be. And, and I felt like they, you know, they should be in the you know, upper third of that range towards the top because of their um, exceeding um, expectations and, and the longevity and what they brought to us. You know, I made a comment last year that, you know, we shouldn't expect 5% raises, you know, every year, you know, especially when it, we're deviating from the MPP. Uh, and although we're trying to create our own guidelines now, but last year, the last year and a half, two years have been completely abnormal, um, you know, with, with COVID and the pandemic and the uh, changes that we've, um, the CEO and CIO had to do on the fly, um, you know, from, from Roberto's perspective, you know, trying to, you know, mitigate or trying to transition from a, a all hands on deck in the office, you know, workflow to, now everybody, we got to get everybody working from home. Do they have the correct equipment? Uh, making sure that resources, or not resources, but services to our membership doesn't um, decrease. And that transition happened very smoothly and it continued to, to do it the second year of, of the pandemic. Um, Prabhu, on the other side, you know, we, Right when the pandemic started, that's when the um, we had the huge market uh, drawdowns. I think it closed to around 33, 34 percent, and it was the end of March. You know, with with his leadership and and Roberto's and the IC uh, and the board chair to convene three meetings within I think three weeks to make asset allocation changes all three times, and their staff was quite busy, and we were able to pretty much capture almost the bottom of it. And now we're reaping the rewards. So my original comment last year of, you know, can't expect to do this every, you know, 5% every year. Well, I also can't ignore 
a 26%, 26.3% return and 29% return for federated. And I think there might be a little bit higher. Um, I, I could support a, I think of any years, this would be the year to go above 5%. Um, going um, up to 10%. I could support, but then I know that's also it'd be on the stretch side. So um, I, I would say anywhere, you know, definitely no more than ten percent, but anywhere between the five and ten percent. If I had to give a range, somewhere in there. Um, so if if we're looking to provide a range, that would be my range for between for both of them. Uh, if we are looking to make a decision, then I, you know I could provide a more accurate number. That's great. It's very helpful in framing it, Andrew. So <laughs> as Harvey, I reached out to Harvey about this. Well, it's supposed to be a bit messy, Drew. You're talking about people's compensation in public. So, you know, put it all out on the table. So, I mean, you know, Sunita, what, what do you think? I mean, you from the financial sector, I mean, I just assume this is just stellar performance, right? You're asking me? Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, absolutely. There's no question that there's a, you know, the, not just a board decision to change asset allocation. It's easy to take credit for that, but execution is key. And certainly um, on the investment side, uh, as an, you know, observer, I can see that Prabhu and team did a fantastic job. And I, I mean, I, I, Andrew has said everything very articulately. So I'd be highly supportive of a, you know, as high an increase as uh, is possible because uh, the financial world continues to be a competitive uh, market for people who are as good as we have here. So. Great, thanks. So uh, let's go ahead and keep it going in order, uh, Eshvar. I, I know that you know Prabhu and so you're a bit reluctant, but but what, what if, if you didn't know him, just looking at this objectively, what do you kind of think? Yeah, so... <clears throat> You know, I think it was a good year, uh, and I think the review kind of shows that. Um, you know, we discussed at our board, uh, we discussed it with Prabhu, um, and I am supportive of making sure that that is rewarded. Um, and, uh, you know, what you said, um, you know, in terms of pay, pay raises, um, you know, I would support that, um, you know, unless there is any pushback, um, you know, but I, I would support what you said, Andrew. Great. Um, Dick? You're yeah, thinking think you're on this a fine job under the circumstances, you know, but we're, as an investment group, we're still not where we want to be. Um, there's always issues that are pending, but uh, I, obvious to me that they work as hard as anybody, but I'm talk to Anzwar who gave me a call to have a discussion. So I will work with the, the group as far as compensation goes, but uh, I'm not anything above 7%. So thank you. Okay, that makes sense. Thanks, Dick. I captured that. Uh, Franco, what do you think? So I, I guess part of it for me is just wondering if we've done any compensation studies. I mean, we've we've got a we've got a, a talented individual. Um, are we, you know, paying a market rate? So I think that's kind of a big deal for me. So I, I don't know if we've done or you guys have done any studies. And not recently. The last one was 2018. I, I, Andrew reached out to me yesterday and said probably time to fire another one up, and that's probably right. Um, Dave, any thoughts? Uh, to be completely fair, since I was just sworn in last year, I can't really evaluate them over the last year. I didn't, I didn't get to work with them. Um, I do appreciate what uh, the investment strategy accomplished over the last year. That was uh, pretty phenomenal. But uh, on this, I probably should abstain. Okay. Well, I have maybe maybe we proceed this way. I know Dick has said not higher than seven percent, but it maybe we maybe we give a range to federated of of sort of five to ten percent, and we've already spoken to them about the sort of ten slash seven and a half. Um, I'm sort of looking at the heads nodding. Ashwar, you think, and, and Andrew, five to ten percent pass it along to Federated as our recommended guidelines, somewhere in there. What do you think, Andrew? You no, know, I, I think so um, because I mean that it's within our range. Um, Dick is has a cap at seven percent. 
Um, and that's something that we could, you know, communicate also, because um, we don't know how Federa is going to feel um, about this either. So uh, this is an extraordinary year, and we're talking about a uh, a pretty uh, hefty um, pay raise. And so I think giving that range, um, you know, that gives them the flexibility of what we're thinking, and we can somewhat get on the same page. Great, Ashfar. What do you think? Makes sense. Can we give five, ten percent to them? Yeah, I, I would support that. Um, yeah, I, you know, and maybe you can say there is a bias, maybe slightly to the higher side, but, uh, yeah. but also respect what Dick said. Um, you know, in terms of what the number should be, um, and yeah. uh, and there is also the the cost of living adjustment, which is an extra three percent. So yeah, that's right. And Ashar, you know, you're empowered to talk directly with Anurag before their meeting as sort of what what you what your synthesis of all yeah. of this. Right. Yeah. Um, well, I'll go ahead and make a motion. I will put these two items together. I will move that we pass on to federated a recommended range of five to ten percent for both our CEO and our CIO. Do I have a second for that motion? I'll second it. Great. Thanks. Uh, let's go around. The, the, I, any any questions or comments? Make questions or comments. I call for your vote. Oh, go ahead. Somebody jump in. Go ahead. Drew, um, yeah. let me just say a couple of things. Uh, obviously, sure, Prabhu please. and I uh, are honored to work with uh, both boards and for the plan members. Uh, but I just wanted to um, make sure that the motion. So the, ha the motion has to be, first of all, obviously, you are both separate independent bodies so there's always yeah. a chance right like the senate and the house that you yeah. don't agree and that's always possible and when you don't agree you have to come back because at yeah. some point you have to pass something that is agreeable to both sides so let me start with that statement yeah. in terms of the motion um i i hope you understand i'm not trying to be difficult neither is prabhu i, I want to explain it has to be a clear motion about what exactly you're recommending, and then let Federated decide whether that's something that they're going to be able to approve or not. Because if, if you motion a range, yeah. what you really, in, in essence, are doing is you you then letting Federated, presumably, I could be mistaken, choose within that range, which means in terms we have to come back to your board, the October meeting, for you to decide whether whatever Federated is elected, you agree with. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, when the information goes to the city, the information has to be, this is the merit increment. Uh, it's not, we are recommending a merit increment between 5 and 10% because the city doesn't get, they don't choose that. This is the board's decision based on measure G. So again, I, I, I understand this is a difficult discussion. Trust me, it's difficult for Prabhu and I uh, to have this discussion in public. Uh, we stand ready to, you know, obviously accept whatever uh, the boards uh, support and approve. But uh, I will, we will respectfully, and of course, Prabhu, feel free to join in. We will respectfully request that when you make a motion, it will be a clear motion as to a, spe a specific merit increment percentage that you are recommending. Otherwise, um, Federated will make a decision. And assuming they approve a specific numbers, it will have to come back to youth board in October for, for approval. Does that and make well, sense? Harvey, go ahead, Robert. I'm sorry, I cut you off. No, I was just asking if that makes sense, what I just explained. No, I think it does. Or, or maybe the board votes to empower Ashron and I to OK Federated. Harvey, you got your hand up. Help us out here, Councilor. Yeah, that, that's what I was going to suggest. Um, you, you and Eshwar have already been designated as labor negotiators normally. The purpose of that is so the, this conversation with your labor negotiators takes place in closed session and, and you give authority to the negotiators. But putting that aside, why don't we have the motion be that the board authorizes its labor negotiators, um, uh, Drew and Eshwar, to uh, agree on behalf of the board uh, to a, an agreed you know, a, a numbers within a range of five to ten percent, um, and then that won't if if 
you can carry that to federated. They can have their discussion. If they come up with a number, you have the delegated discretion as the labor negotiators to accept the number and then it would be binding on police and fire and binding on federated at that time at their meeting. Or if in your judgment as negotiators, you don't want to agree to the number, then you can bring it back to this board for further instructions. Um, but at least the process will be able to move forward that way. Does that make sense? In other words, let me, let me yeah, restate it. The motion. Yeah, I think the board is supportive. Yeah, I think that's good. So, Harvey, let me, let me go ahead and amend my motion. The, the ranges say as the motion was originally made, but add to the motion um, that Eshvar and I be empowered by this board to sign off on um, a raise within that range or to decide that we want to bring it back to the board. Um, Eshvar, do you approve that amendment to the motion? Yes, I approve. Th that kind of captured, right, Harvey? Yes, you got it. Uh, great. Okay. Um, let's go around. Andrew? Aye. Uh, Sunita? Aye. Uh, Eshwar? Aye. Uh, Dick, before I ask, I, I will communicate to them your 7% number. Eshwar and I vote. So, Dick, you vote aye or nay? I vote yes. Uh, Franco? Aye. Uh, Dave? Yeah, that's actually something I can get behind. You guys have the experience, so uh, I'll vote aye. Thank you. Well, thanks, Dave. And and this chair, Lanza, I will vote aye as well. Uh, great. I'll I'll send out an email um, on that um, and copy you, Eshvar, so the Spencer and Anurag know what's what's what. Um, okay, I think we're on to committees. So back uh, to you, Eshvar. Do, do, um, do yes, go ahead, Virgo. One last one last comment. Sure. Uh, so, and maybe council can mention, I think we're okay, but I just want to make sure that we're clear. The city only moves forward when they have either the board minutes or they have um, indication that the board has approved. Um, no. I'm, I'm assuming that when you communicate with Spencer and when the issue come up or federated, they'll choose a specific number rather than a range. Otherwise we have the same discussion for both boards in October. I'm assuming that's what you're looking for. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna draft the email to him right now. Um, and, and I'm gonna set up a meeting. I'm actually set up a meeting between um, Anurag, Eshvar, uh, Spencer, and myself, so we're all clear. And, and so if that's the case, and then Federated make a recommendation and approval, then I would think that the city will need an email from you and as for as negotiator that were just approved with the range today by you board to say that on behalf of the board based on today's meeting, you are uh, supporting a federated uh, recommendation. Otherwise they're not gonna move forward until they hear an approval from the full board. I just wanted, it just, this is just a matter of practicality how this is supposed to work. So I just wanna make sure that I'm clear that if the city asks me, I'm providing the right explanation. What I just explained, does that sound about right? That makes sense. I, so if I understand it's right, so we, we've recorded the vote, it will be in the minutes. And so then as long as Esther and I communicate and probably be a joint communication between um, all four of us, right? Right, Eshvar, myself, Anurag and Spencer saying, this is what we would like, then we're okay. And and you're thinking Roberto, that will be okay because um, Federer will probably actually vote on a number. Uh, yeah, I, that's what I'm guessing. Uh, you know, but I'm assuming that discussion will take place before that between the two of you and the two of them. But yes, okay, I, I'm clear. Right. Thank you. Yeah, no, thanks, Roberto. And by the way, board, we're really indebted to Roberto. It's not comfortable for him to be driving his own um, performance review stuff. But um, neither Spencer nor myself nor Eshvar. Um, we are all sort of battlefield promotions. So thank you, Virgil, for, for helping keep us on the, the paths of rectitude and veracity. All right, hey, let's, um, let's switch to committee. Yeah. We're almost I'm, done. I have some okay. trouble Go, Excuse Ray, me, sorry, Ray. Excuse Wait, me Mr. Ahead. Chair. Uh, we need to discuss 4J. Yeah, thank, thank you, Linda. I, I, I'm heading for the exit. Ray, I see you there. True, true. Oh, what's true. that? Yeah. Uh, before we leave this um, item, one thing that needs to be included in all this is part of the compensation is, or um, 
uh, merit increases is uh, also the additional executive leave. So when you part of this group, you guys will also have to determine executive leaves. Um, does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, you know I'm, what? Thank you. Right yes, thank you so much. I always forget about that. Um, thank God that you are a firefighter with the city, Andrew. Much appreciated. So um, without disclosing the ratings for Prabhu and I, there are um, a specific numbers of executive days that are approved. Uh, that information is in the guidelines that were attached to items G and H. And so based on those ratings, then Drew, you can make a recommendation for the approval of the executive days, uh, which is up to, if we both receive the highest rating, then it will be up to five days. Yep, Did I explain that correctly, right. Andrew? Yeah, that's correct. I'm capturing it right now in my email. That's great. All right, any more discussion? Uh, if not, over to you, Ray. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Drew. He had to be <laughs> part of emotion, but I didn't hear the motion. Did I hear emotion? Uh, well, I don't think we need to move. Do we need? I don't think we need to move that. Do we? I mean, you, you need to. The, 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 the board. The city expects an approval from the city about the executive days. So I need to be able to tell them that both boards approve the number of executive days. I see. Councilmember Foley is sort of moving her head. That's correct. Is that correct, uh, uh, Councilmember Foley? Yes, she's saying yes. Yes, it well, is. Me, I just went through this with my staff. Yeah. So we could just make an amendment to the original motion and it's revote. Well, why don't we go just go ahead and make a, a separate motion? Um, I move that this board um, extend to um, Ashfar and myself uh, the authority to complete the negotiation on executive days. Is there a second? A second. Right. Let's go around the room. Andrew? Hi. Sunita? Hi. Ashfar? Hi. Dick? Yes. Franco? Hi. Hi. Dave? Hi. And I'm Chair Lenz. I vote aye. That's great. Um, anything else before the long suffering race storms gets to go? <laughs> <laughs> great. Go on over to you, Ray. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm sorry that uh, you spoke at this earlier, but I was told 11.30, I was told 1. I am now here. I've been watching since 10.30, and I have to tell you, as a lay person, the information that was brought out was excellent. I really actually thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you so much for all you do as a board. Uh, it's amazing to me. You, you do realize, Ray, you just admitted that you're intrigued by actuarial numbers. You know that, right? <laughs> I know, and I'm not a finance guy by no means, but it was it was amazing. Thanks, Ray. Keep going, Ray. Okay, so here we go. Uh, you all should have got the letter distributed to everybody on, I know it says PTSD. It's really mental health. So let me let me go through a few things and then I'll talk, then we can talk together. So I've been dealing with the disability committee for about 12, over 12 years now. And I attend it once a month and you guys do a great job of running it. Being that I do that, I get more information from a lot of different people, not only from the people that show up at your, your thing, but I get a lot of phone calls. And Dick, uh, I believe, and Franco, and Andrew can attest this, in the firehouse and probably in PD, people have a hard time talking about incidents that are bothering them. They really do. And sometimes, I know back in my day, they looked at it as being weak. And the CSI team, Critical Incident Stress Match team, was just forming, to, you know, not quite towards the end of my career, but I, I set in on a few of those. And people didn't want to talk. They didn't want to talk if they were having an issue. But what I'm finding now is people are more willing to talk when they have retired. I'll get phone calls about, people that are suffering mental issues, whether it's PTSD or anything. Now understand, this past year, we've had 43 members die. Two of those members were by suicide, and I can't tell you anything about mental health on the others because it's all HIPAA and I don't know. But being that I've talked to a lot of people about this subject, that's why I'm here today. 
when you start talking about PTSD and mental health, I want you to understand something. We cannot unsee what we've seen. You just can't. Now, for me personally, certain smells will take me right back to an incident. Other people have certain sounds. Other people have dreams. But with that said, PTSD untreated or mental health falls into other problems, whether it be alcohol abuse, drug abuse, domestic violence, the breaking up of families, divorce. It's a big bubble. On top of that, I want to look from the health side. What is this costing us in our how do I put in our medical bills that we have at the end of the year that we pay? There's there. I know it has an effect on that also. So when you're looking at this, then I'm putting this forward is I'll be having conversations with city council members one by one, and if not in a full outblown meeting with the, with the whole council at some point. If you read the letter, what we're looking for is a buy-in. This board, I know it's a fiduciary, but it's all, oh, sorry. Sorry, that was my phone, I meant to turn it off. When you guys are a fiduciary, but it is the Police and Fire Retirement Pension Fund. Okay? So I know you're a fiduciary. I know you look at it that way. But I also need you to look at it from a, a member standpoint. Okay? In our association, we have 1,400 members. I'm sure there's a couple, two, 300 members that are not members out there that are retired, just in police and fire. Looking at this, this issue of mental health, when we were on the job, we had a mental health plan. And I know the city's going through a process now to get a new company. When you retired, that disappeared. And that's when you actually probably need it the most. A lot of guys and gals that retire go through issues upon retiring. Okay? Depression can fall in. All these things affect our health plan. When you look at us not having it back in 1997, this has been going on since 1997, trying to get a plan for retirees. That's 24 years. That is just too long in my humble opinion. What we're asking from you is when we approach a city and discuss this, and you can talk about the current events with BTA and other issues throughout the country, I'll be talking to the city you know, council members about this. What we're asking you is when the city comes to you and says, hey, we need to have this numbers crunched. Can you and will you do it? And we're asking for your support in that. And that's what this whole thing's about. It's about taking care of our members. And I'm seeing a big drop in what we need to do. And that's where I'm coming from in this. Um, I don't know what else to tell you other than that the numbers say it all. If you read it, compared to a regular civilian, five times the likelihood of depression and some of these PTSD symptoms. Five times for both police and fire. That's unbelievable. And that, we have no mechanism of help out there. I know there are some for veterans, you know, that you've been in the Navy, Army, whatnot, there's avenues for them. And we try and move them in that direction. And yes, currently I'm trying to work with the current CISM team, both for police and fire, and get some buy-in from them, and they're already willing to help, and get some of our retirees that used to be on the CSM team to get them reestablished and have them help. But there are guidance and move people in the right direction. So this is what we're looking for. We need to get a help plan medical mental health plan incorporated somehow some way and i'm not willing to give up on this it's too important to me um so i'm asking for your guys assistance do you have any questions for me at this point yeah yeah well, let me let me 
Uh, Harvey, if you're still on, what are the guidelines on something like this? Well, there really aren't guidelines. Um, I mean, we, we can advocate for something that we, we can't, there's nothing that we can take action on, but um, the board could certainly uh, endorse. Uh, I mean, this, this is um, only uh, agendized today as a presentation, so it's not an action item. Um, but if you wanted to come back at the next meeting, if somebody wanted, uh, you know, a, a, a board statement that it encourages the city to consider, uh, including retirees in the program, uh, that's certainly within the, the parameters of the board's uh, um, jurisdiction regarding the, the well-being of its retiree members. We, we, we wouldn't need a motion on that, right, Harvey? We would then see it next month and move on that. Yes? We wouldn't do a motion now, but if, if, if you want to, for the board to take any action, even by way of a letter of encouragement or something like that, it would have to be agendized as an action item. Okay. Hey, um, yes, go ahead, Andrew. You know, uh, Ray, I, I appreciate you bringing this uh, subject matter up for, and, you know, it's something that you definitely know is near and dear to you, and it's important for all retirees, and it's a serious issue. Um, what Ray is specifically asking from what I heard from him was if and when the city comes to the board and says, hey, we want to run some actuarial numbers, would we grant permission or provide permission? Is that correct, Ray? Yes, and I also agree with uh, Harvey in that the letter would be nice to say we or ad we advocate for this also. It's really trying to move forward for everybody. So I know it's going to be a process. I would hope that if it does, the city does come to you for an actuary study, that it's a quick one. It's not one of the ones that take a year, two years. That's that's too far out, to be honest. I, I, this is something that should have been acted on years ago, and it hasn't. So the sooner, the better. Uh, I talked to... Councilmember Foley on a one-on-one, -on -one, just a slight bit about this, and I will be having another meeting with you, Councilmember. Um, and yeah, I think it's just important. So I'll be setting up meetings with each council member. Hopefully, they'll all meet with me, and then if not, I will have a I will turn to a council meeting itself and have that agendized also. So yes, I would like this agendized for next month, as a um, as Harvey put it. I'd, I don't have any better words than what Harvey said. Hey, uh, Pam, I see you got your hand up. Go ahead and jump in. I, I just want to first thank Ray again for bringing this to our attention and to my attention and to invite you to sit down with me again and we can figure out how we might be able to proceed with this. I'd like to get more background from you one-on-one, uh, -on -one, what's happened in the past, why the benefit fell off, you know, a lot of things like that that I don't understand that we probably don't have time for here, but I'm, I'm happy to work with you, Ray. In fact, I'd be honored and proud to sit down and work with you on this. Thank you so, so much. Hey, this is probably one of those kind of things, uh, let me just jump in, this is probably one of those kind of things where we just want, you probably need one board member to be a liaison. Andrew, you willing to just be a liaison between Ray and Roberto and staff to agendize something? Yeah, no problem. Okay. Is that right, Harvey? That's kind of all we need. And then, and then it shows up on the agenda next month and we know what we need to do, right? Yeah, that's perfectly fine. I'm sorry. I, was that you, Dick? I may have cut somebody off. Yeah, Floor's yes, up. it was. Uh, I really appreciate President Storm bringing our attention. I appreciate Council Member Foley weighing in. And what I see is a, just a request to speed up the numbers and work together once the council gets involved, be sensitive. Let me tell you folks something now, and I won't go through the whole spill. I got 54 years experience. This issue has destroyed families and so on. And because of firefighters and police officers, do not go out in the public and whine about these issues, we hold it in. 
They wrote a book years ago called The New Centurions. That was about police. Well, fire is there. Uh, I've, we've all seen deaths, but lately here, we're having too many firefighters and police officers that are taking their lives and destroying families. We need to address this. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Dick. Um, floor is open. Anybody else want to weigh in? Yeah, Drew, this is Dave. If I can say a few things. Ray, thank sure. you for bringing this up. It's something that the POA has been fighting for for years. Um, we have health care coverage or mental health coverage when you're an active member, but as soon as you retire. That wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> we have mental health coverage for all our active members, but as soon as you retire, it's cut off. And uh, I know at least that Franco and I are on the same page, and I would assume Andrew, Ray, and Dick are in the same place where we've lost friends um, due to suicide shortly after they retire. And it is absolutely heartbreaking that we just cut them off as soon as they leave uh, and uh, leave service with the city. And to me, it's a, it's a tragedy. The, the horrors they take are from the job and we should continue into retirement, uh, helping to take care of our, our brothers and sisters. That's well said, Dave. Um, any other comments? I, 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 I sense from past history, you'll get broad support from this board for this. Thank you, much appreciated. Yeah, thanks, Ray. Um, let's go ahead and go into, uh, we've got about another 20 minutes and then we're gonna get cut off. Uh, so let's let's do like no more than five minutes per committee. Um, you're up first as for our investment committee. Yeah, so we had a meeting uh, end of last month um, and the topics at this meeting, um, Jay Kwan did uh, an overview of the public markets. Um, we had the, the norm, routine uh, risk overview from by Barris. Um, we did do a discussion of, uh, of the you know, pension obligation bonds. Um, we discussed manager decisions uh, for the year, uh, the first half of the year. And lastly, uh, Christina did a presentation on our China exposure, just given uh, some of the events that we've seen uh, in recent weeks. Uh, Great, Thank any questions for Eshvar? Um, if not, for the record, let me note that we've received and will file the minutes of the June 22nd and June 29th. Um, at June 22nd, Police and Fire Investment Committee, June 28th, Joint Committee. Um, Howard's not here. Um, Roberto, anything to say about audit? I think you're on mute, Roberto. Yes, yes, I was, and you passed the test. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, no, nothing, nothing to be uh, to update the the board on uh, on the uh, audit committee. We had a, a good discussion. Um, our new senior auditor does a great job, and um, and there's there's nothing new to update the board on. I mean, we had the meeting and uh, they discussed one um, audit that was still ongoing. So we'll be ready for the for the next meeting with our new uh, chair which uh, I'm going to be having a meeting in the next couple of weeks to make sure that we can bring her up to date on the, uh, on the audit work. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Uh, thanks, Roberto, for filling in for Howard. Let me note um, that we're going to receive and file the minutes of the May 20th meeting, um, the 6:30-21 quarterly travel and attendance uh, report, and the update, the uh, regular update on the city auditor's recommendations uh, to ORS. Uh, governance committee, um, Bert, do you want to do that one too? Yeah, let me comment on the governance committee. We have a meeting right afterwards, and this morning, two of you have the log and the uh, amazing surprise to be added to the governance committee. <laughs> and as if this meeting has not been long enough, we will politely ask you to stay on, uh, well, you have to re, uh, uh, sign off in this meeting and join the governance committee. I believe you may have received uh, the Zoom invitation link to the meeting already. And uh, the governance committee uh, meeting at least should not be uh, a long meeting, but if you could stay so that Police and Fire has a quorum, that would be great. Yeah, thank you uh, for the uh, battle for promotions. The beers are on me when next we meet in person, that's a promise. Um, disability committee, Dick, any, anything you want to comment on? 
you know, they said the next meeting will be the 12th, but you remember Russ Raketa said he couldn't make that, so I'm, I'm looking at a change. But I will say this, we had an excellent meeting, staff did a good job and everything. The new doctor's report to right on the money, it gave us a lot of uh, information that we needed. Didn't have to ask that many questions because it was detailed and everything else. So thank you. Thank you, Dick. And- um, uh, Mr. Chair? Oh. Let's go, Roberto. Roberto, sorry. No, no, go, go ahead. ahead. I'll wait for the next one. Well, um, well, I'm now the chair of the JPC, but we haven't met yet. So <laughs> Roberto, you're really doing a lot of work this meeting. Go ahead. No, I, um, so you may recall that Trustee Sanceri was uh, the chair of that committee. Uh, the chair of the committee has to be selected by the actual joint personnel committee. And so the question to you board will be, uh, you are there because you're the chair of the board. Uh, Trustee Menon is also a member because he's the IC chair. You need to select uh, an extra um, member to join uh, the uh, the joint personnel committee. So whether you want to do it now um, uh, under the committee assignments or whether you want to leave that for the next meeting, you can do that. Uh, but uh, there's got to, you know, there's a need to uh, appoint a third uh, a third trustee of your board. And 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 we asked Andrew is Andrew said he'd do it because he's got the experience. Is that right? Is my memory right? Uh, correct for the JPC. So we've got that, that item um, discussion and action on board committee assignments was uh, four I. So can we can we do it under that, Roberto? I I'm going to defer to council, but I think that he is uh, smart enough, but also flexible enough to say that I think that's doable, uh, Mr. Uh, Litterman. That's doable. Oh yeah. <laughs> you didn't use the answer. Anyway. Um, I move that we um, um, put Andrew Gardner on the uh, Joint Personnel Committee. Is there a second? Second. A second. That's great. Uh, second by uh, Santos. Uh, let's go around the room. Andrew? Aye. Uh, Sunita? Aye. Uh, Eshvar? Aye. Dick? Yes. Go. Aye. Uh, Dave? Aye. I vote I as well. Man, that was a real on the East Coast is cocktail hour back here, for God's sakes. Um, anything else, Roberto? Any uh, anything else from anybody on the board? Uh, if not, we'll see y'all in uh, three or four weeks. I know.